So we're going to continue to see the amount of data continue to grow. The sources of data are continuing to grow. All right, within the next five years, there's going to be over 20 billion connected devices to the internet, all generating data that you as researchers are going to want to analyze and understand. As we continue to become more connected, we're also more at risk. So when we think about the fact of this being a cybersecurity day, over one million cybersecurity attacks happen every day. And as we become more connected, we can't go with the old style of we're just going to put up this moat, this wall around us. Right? We have to enable communication. We have to enable people to come in and out. So therefore, we have to transform the way we look at security. The thing about change is change brings opportunities. Again, we see this this morning around how we understand how the human body works. Right? We, we see how we can develop products faster. Right? Companies are using technology to get a competitive advantage. So the example of a motorcycle being developed 100% digitally. So that allows me to get a product to market faster, cheaper, and better. Right? 15, 20 years ago, it would take 10 to 15 years to see a new car get recycled. Now we see new cars, new models every couple of years because technology is changing. Entire industries are changing. General Electric is a really good example where today they don't even sell jet engines anymore. They sell propulsion. They are literally selling propulsion to the airlines. The airlines are only paying General Electric when the plane's in the air. GE is using sensors on their engines to allow them to fly higher. By flying higher, they fly more efficient. More efficient means less fuel, means more money, right? more to the bottom line of General Electric. We've seen a lot of examples of this today of change for good. Right? Things like genomic research, being able to take these larger data sets and do more with them faster. Greater clarity of the data, more information coming out of those which ultimately enables human progress. One of the things Michael Dell talked about when he made the acquisition of EMC uh, was this ability to be able to drive forward human progress, to be able to create end-to-end -end solutions that benefit all people. There's some discussions this morning around this idea of laws, laws of physics. Right? Everyone's pretty familiar with Morse law, which says every 18 months, computational capacity is going to double. Another law that's emerging these days is this idea of 10x. So every five years, we'll see a 10x increase in the amount of storage, the amount of memory, the speed of memory, the speed of CPUs. So when we start looking out at the future, in the next 15 years, we're going to see three 10x improvements. Right? Those three 10x improvements come out to a 1,000x improvement in the amount of storage I have, the amount of memory I have, the amount of compute I have. All right, so when you think about the things that you can do today that you couldn't do five years ago, think about what we're going to be able to do 15 years from today. So without a doubt, I think the period of the most unprecedented change around technology, uh, and it's just exciting to be a part of it. A good example of this, which fits in well with what we're talking about today, is they estimate by 2032, we'll be able to sequence a genome in 94 seconds, where today it takes weeks. All right, continuing to see those sorts of changes. There's a lot of discussion today around software. As the hardware gets faster and has more capability, it enables us to go out and build better software, faster software, right? make better decisions. We're going to see a lot of uh, interest around augmented reality, which we saw this morning. Right, virtual reality is going to completely change the way we interact. And it changes because of the experience. We've had teleconferencing and video conferencing and things like that for a while, but it's not the same interacting with a person over that 2D medium. But once you bring that augmented reality into the picture, you get the experience. We were talking outside about whether it's, it's roller coaster rides. Right? We had a, a, an opportunity at Dell EMC World where we had a, a uh, a top of a, of a building, and there was a little walkway you could walk out on. And you were literally in the conference room floor on carpet, but as you put on the visor and you walked out on this beam, it felt like you were 30, 30 stories off the ground. And you saw all these people just 
inching along and moving, and it's very entertaining to watch it, but it's the way our mind works, right? That once we perceive something, then we physiologically experience it, and it completely changes uh, the way we interact with systems. So ultimately, the belief is that customers are looking for a partner to help them transform, to help them understand how do we continue to change and continue to stay ahead of the curve as it relates to technology and leverage it for the most benefits. What Dell EMC gives you right, is this portfolio of multiple companies. Certainly you're familiar with Dell, right? but there's additional companies as well, both from a cloud perspective, certainly VMware from a virtualization perspective, uh, and then around the security pieces and stuff like that. Right? Dell specifically looking more and more on the client side of things and how we interact there. Right, we're less than five years away from interacting with our computers pretty much completely with our eyes. That technology already exists today. Right, for anyone who's familiar with, with Samsung and their Galaxy phones where you can actually look at something, as soon as your eyes look away, the video will stop because it's sensing what you're doing. All right, Microsoft is already doing things as well as Dell where you're actually controlling and interacting with the system with your facial features in your eyes. So as you're looking around, the cursor is moving. All right, so think about as we continue to evolve how it changes the way we interact with technology. I remember when I was a kid, we would often talk about the fact that at some point we'd be implanted with chips so everyone could keep track of us, right? We change that by introducing these things. <laughs> they don't need to put a chip in anymore, right? This is our chip. The amount of data that comes off of these things says so much about what we do and how we do it. Go out right now and, and Google something and get into Facebook, and within seconds of you Googling whatever that is, the ads for it are in Facebook. Right, so the amount of technology, the way it's all coming together, uh, really gets us into this idea of the transformation that's occurring uh, overall within our industry, and, and how we all interact with technology is changing very, very significantly. Specifically from a higher educational perspective, right, it's looking at this idea of a digital transformation. Education is one of those mediums that is about to be transformed very, very significantly. Part of your job is to impart knowledge, and the world is full of knowledge. Fifty years ago, I had to come to a higher, an institution like this to get access to your brains. Today, I can get access to a lot of it on the internet. Right? Now, what you do is you help filter it and make sure it's appropriate and all those other sorts of things, but information is becoming a currency and it's freely available. So how do we need to continually evolve the, the way we do things, right? How do we evolve? I thought it was interesting earlier thinking about the, the holodeck uh, and could I actually record uh, classes that way? And as a student, go back and instead of reading over my notes, I could literally sit there and watch the, the lecture over and over again and stop at certain parts and zoom into other parts and understand the things I wanted to do. And maybe I do that on my phone. Maybe I do it on a tablet. All right, think about things like Google Glass. And Google Glass was maybe a little bit ahead of itself, but this idea of we're going to interact with people with augmented reality. So when you go up to meet someone, you may see their LinkedIn profile that's there. You may see their Facebook profile. You may see all the things about them from their social network that's actually being presented to you in real time. So the way, the way education interacts, certainly K to 12, those sorts of things, now we're getting into indiv individualized education. Right? It was interesting, I was having a conversation with someone the other day where we were talking about the one-room schoolroom. In the old days, there were no grades. Right? Everyone was in that room and everyone learned at their own pace and did their own thing. There's a little bit of a move back towards that. Right? And maybe if I'm good at math, I'm at a grade seven level, but if I'm struggling in English, I'm really at a grade three level. But I'm learning at my own pace, and that's what makes sense. So continuing to see that happen. Right? For the digitization to happen, IT needs to transform. Right. One of the things we've seen in the last few years is this introduction of cloud. And what cloud has really done is change the way you all interact with IT. Gone are the days of submitting a request and, and, and sending in emails and waiting six months for something. Back to this instant on world thing, I go to a website and I click and I put in a credit card and I have access to technology. So how do we make it easier for technology? How do we, certainly for you again as an educational facility, how do we make sure we have adequate technology to get students to come here? Over 80% of new employees today make decisions on which company to go to work for based on how much technology they have. 20 years ago, we went to work to get access to technology. Today, we all have better technology at home than we do at work. 
So continuing to transform IT to stay ahead of that. The academ academic and administrative transformations. Again, the way I learn, the way each student learns, the way they interact with the systems. Right? Everyone wants online access to everything, but then how do I keep it secure? How do I make sure as I'm doing these things, right, I'm not jeopardizing the privacy of my students and or material and things like that. And then the last one's directly to that, this idea of cybersecurity. How do I keep all this secure? As I continue to change the model, as I continue to do things like smart campuses, right, some of the things that we're starting to see out there, uh, as campuses become more and more connected, right, changing the way I deliver academics, changing the way that students interact. There's apps being developed so they can, students can actually understand where to go. If you're a freshman new at school, maybe you have an app that walks you through the entire thing. Right? I, I was talking to a colleague earlier today. He has an app where he can, in real time, look at a, a different language and it will interpret it in real time back to English or whatever other language he wants. Right? Leveraging technology to do things. And then clearly on the, on the research side, right, continuing to be able to build larger and larger systems. More. You mentioned it earlier, right? More data, more memory, more CPU, because I want to do it faster. We're going to, to continue to evolve where I think for the last, you know, 100 years or so, or I guess really through history, the value has always been in the answers, where today the value is more becoming about the questions. As information becomes freely available, the, the value of currency becomes, can I ask better questions? Because with better questions come better answers. So specifically around the HPC, right? I, I just want to hit on that a little bit. I didn't want this to be about products, but uh, it's an important part of, of the world for us from a Dell EMC perspective. It's certainly a focus area, right? Continuing to make sure that the right resources exist to get better answers. Right. And certainly discussion around drugs. Right. We're not that far away from individualized drug plans. We're not that far away from uh, individuals as they get born, their, their human genome being sequenced right there in the hospital. Right. And we continue to provide newer solutions for them as they go along. To that end, right, how, do we, how do we fix, cure, solve some of these biggest issues that are facing mankind today? Right, and the ability to be able to do some of the things we're talking about, about drugs, being able to identify how we can interact better is very, very important. I heard a statement earlier about making HPC easier. Right? The biggest challenge around technology is it's hard. And you all aren't technologists. You shouldn't be technologists. You should be researchers. You should do the things that you're passionate about. It's our job to make technology easier. And that's one of the driving forces behind uh, Michael Dell purchasing EMC is can we create more end-to-end -end solutions uh, from what we call edge to core to cloud where it's better integrated, it's easier to operate, it's simpler, provides more value overall. So really that's our goal here is to make it easier to order these systems, right? make sure that we're actually designing them specifically for the things that you want to do. So your local Dell EMC team will be able to engage specialists that will be able to come in and, and understand what you're trying to get out of the system and make sure we're designing something that's going to give you the most value from that. And then the third one is making it easy to set up. Vast majority of technology solutions are science projects. Right? It comes in 50 different boxes and requires a PhD in, in putting stuff together to get it to work. And then once you get it all together, widget A doesn't fit into widget B. Right? Or this piece of software is not the right level for something else. Right? So making sure that it's pre-engineered pre-designed to be able to hit the ground faster so that you get more immediate results. To that end, right, is making it easier again for the IT folks to be able to go out and build an HPC system. We'd like to believe that there's, you know, a cookie cutter approach to things, but the reality is everything's different. Right? The world is made up of snowflakes. So giving you tools to be able to go in and understand, here's what a basic system looks like. But here's the customizations that I would like to have specifically for my environment. It's just a picture, kind of what it looks like. Right? But the whole idea here is self-contained. As few racks as possible. Right? If I can get more CPU, more memory, more storage, and a smaller footprint using less power, it's beneficial for everyone. 
just a high level kind of some of the benefits here, right, is the ability to be able to make sure that we're accelerating your benefits. Faster time to value, right? Making sure that we understand what you want to do with the system, pre-testing it, pre-validating, make sure it's all engineered and ready to go. Right? That's the real value that we can bring. To that end, right, I think the other key component here is technology fails. It's, it's, we can do whatever we want to do, technology fails, because at the end of the day, it knows on and off. That's it. That's all the CPU knows. It's pretty simple stuff. Right? We build a lot of software on top of it, and then we build more software on top of that and more software. And as we continue to evolve, the layers of software get deeper and deeper. Right? I heard the other day that right now there's, there's 100 million lines of code in a Tesla. 100 million. Kind of boggles the mind a little, right? So things happen, things break. So again, I think the benefit of the larger company is making sure you have single call, single call for support, making it easier to get it back up and running again. I don't think we're judged by, we're fa by our failures, we're judged by how quickly we can recover from those failures. Right, so this is an important part of that. Last piece I'll add around this is, is this whole idea of, you know, Dell EMC actually makes it easier for you to acquire technology. And this is important today mainly because, again, this idea of cloud has in a lot of ways changed the economics of IT as well. Traditional IT was, I went and bought something, I brought it to my facility and I owned it for X period of time and uh, when I was done with it, I did whatever with it, right? And I bought another one. And uh, for some situations, that's the right thing to do because I may have a constant workload that I want to use over a, a certain period of time. But in a lot of cases, a lot of our workloads are very sporadic and very temporal in nature. So what the cloud has, has introduced is again this idea of utility computing. Can I actually look at and purchase compute much like I purchase power? 150 years ago in America, every manufacturing facility had a power plant. Every manufacturing facility had a power group. That's what they did, right? They provided power to the, to the facility. But then we reached a point where that didn't make sense anymore. Similarly here, right? A lot of our customers don't want to be in the IT business. They want to be in the research business or the education business or the, the, the healing people business or whatever the case may be and not in the IT business. So there needs to be changing models to where uh, you can choose to rent equipment. You can choose to pay for it utility-wise. Uh, you can choose to purchase it. So it's just a variety of options to make sure that uh, you can get technology in a model that works for you and what you're trying to achieve. Last slide is just this idea of right, making sure that we can continue to increase the efficiency. Right, there's some numbers here that are interesting, but it's really about this idea of reducing time to value. How can I get time to value to be faster? How can I take the dollars that you're being given for research and development and get it working faster? Just a few references that are up here uh, that I ran across as I was kind of looking at some customers and things like that. Uh, TGen, right, RNA sequencing from seven days to four hours. It's a pretty significant reduction. Uh, the NMTRC, right, this ability to be able to do, do genomic profiling in 5.9 days. Right, so when we start talking about things like cancer and being able to treat cancer faster, that could literally be the difference between life and death for some of these young, young people and things like that. So. My last slide, uh, why are we different? Right? Why, why is Dell EMC? Why, why are we a company that would like to have your business and like to continue to be involved? Uh, and it is about this idea of innovation. Uh, we spend four and a half, four point six billion dollars a year on innovation, hold over 20,000 patents, right? continue to drive forward technology. You'll see a whole new uh, server refresh coming here within the next couple of months. Right, it's going to revolutionize what we're doing there. You're going to see a lot of changes on the storage front, continuing to leverage uh, storage that's going to be larger and faster. Right. Uh, the solution innovation. I think that's important when we talk about things like HPC and these appliances and those sorts of things. You'll see more and more of an appliance and solution approach. How can we continue to make it easier? Uh, the other thing you'll see is, is more and more collaboration between the member companies of Dell Technologies. 
the strategically aligned businesses, the VMwares, the Virtue Streams, the Dell EMCs, the Dell, all those other sorts of things. So for you as a customer, if you make an investment, uh, you get benefits across all those, right? And you get better vertically focused solutions. And then the last one's around the customer. Customer is always our number one objective. It was interesting to, to recently join the Dell family and, and I was just in, in uh, Las Vegas with, with Michael Dell doing our field kickoff and his number one objective is customer net promoter. What do you as a customer think of us as a company? Because if we're not doing the right things there, we're failing. All right, so my ask is uh, if we are doing that, let us know how we can help. Uh, hopefully this was interesting and, and somewhat helpful brief uh, introduction to what we're doing as Dell EMC and thank you again for all your time. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, any question? If not, I'd like to invite Dr. Lambrecht to come up and prepare. So Dr. Lambrecht is a professor in the physics department. Uh, he will give the talk about predicting materials properties and new materials from first principles. So Dr. Lambrecht obtained his doctorate of science in physics at Ken. Uh, university in Belgium, so a while ago. And then uh, he had a stop at Universidad Nacional del Sur in Bahia Bianca, Argentina, also at Max Planck Institute in Germany, before moving to TACE. And so we will learn about how to predict materials behaviors essentially from the first principles theory. And let's take over. All right, good afternoon. Um, so I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. Um, OK, yeah, OK. Which one should I use? So, this one or this one? Oh, I like to walk around a little bit. Then I see what I'm doing. <laughs> Is it on? I want you to switch it on. OK, so yes, yeah, so I guess in a day about technology, everybody is thinking that everything is bits, but I'm telling you, you know, the atoms and <laughs> uh, the materials also matter. Um, so yeah, so you know, we're used in our history lessons and so on to think about uh, the you know, a civilization or a time period or the technology of a time period in terms of materials, right? We had the Stone Age and the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. And so where are we now today? Well, um, you know, I don't know if this is going to work here. Yeah, let me not bother with it. But you guys all know, I had a little video clip in here from, you know, the graduate. You all know that, uh, you know, Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> idea was we live in the age of plastics and maybe that's not so great but I think more people would say that we're really defined by silicon this age because that's what gives us all the uh, chips in our wonderful computers and cell phones and so on um, oops, I'm going too far here so I'd like to make the point that a lot of new technologies getting new materials or the right material is actually key to the technology um, our lighting with White LEDs were, became possible thanks to a material gallium nitride, which was developed in the 70s, got a Nobel Prize in physics a couple years ago. Um, everywhere in your, well, even these things are used in your cell phones as a backlighting in our computers and all of that. Um, they all have need somehow, if you have a touch phone, it needs transparent conductors. Um, Indium tin oxide is the material that's been used in many things, but we're looking for replacements for that because indium is one of the rare elements in the world and uh, also expensive. Um, batteries, another key technology. Well, one new interesting material that people came up with is lithium cobalt oxide, but we're still trying to find better improvements. Hydrogen storage, metal hydrides, liquid crystal displays, your hard disk, well, there are all kinds of interesting magnetic materials in there too. So that brings me kind of to um, the idea of the Materials Genome Initiative. Um, <clears throat> so we've seen all of these technologies like gallium nitride was maybe first starting to be looked at as a semiconductor in the 1970s. 
it took until a few years ago before you can go buy to the store and go out to the store and buy white LEDs, right? Um, the giant magnetoresistive effect was discovered in the 90s and it has led to all the technology that's used in hard disks that took about 10 years to go to development. So a few years ago, uh, President Obama actually came up with, started this materials genome initiative, a sort of vision statement, uh, as a, and it's made basically a multi-agency initiative and, you know, funding agencies at the government, that means designed to create a new area of policy, resources, and infrastructure that support U.S. institutions in the effort to discover, manufacture, and deploy advanced materials twice as fast at a fraction of the cost. And that last, those last few words are directly from uh, Obama's statement there. So the idea is to accelerate the time between the basic science discoveries, in particular for materials, and to make them available in commercial uh, implementations. So what does it mean in practice these days? Well, it took off, you can go to this website to see what they have been, been doing over the years. And it took a few years before the different funding agencies reacted and you know, filtered down how they interpret this thing. At NSF, there is a program called DMREF, which stands for Designing Materials to Revolutionize and Engineer Our Future, nice acronym. And at DOE Basic Energy Sciences, they have a special part of the uh, Connors Matter Physics, that's predictive theory and modeling. And the emphasis on many of these programs is computational prediction of materials properties. Um, things like new buzzwords are high throughput calculations where uh, machine learning, data mining, automated searches. So some people say in physics, we've gone sort of from an experimental branch, experimental science to theory. Then there was computational physics. And now there is the fourth branch to that is actually big data and data mining. Um, so then, but in particular NSF, you know, what I like is that they also put emphasis on validation by experiment because we can calculate whatever we want, but if we don't test it, you know, as the English say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, right? So we have to do that. And there has to be feedback loops between theory, experiment, and design to make this whole accelerated um, feature come to work. So here at CASE uh, DMREF, we have two DMREFs funded at this point. That's uh, Matthew Willard. I think that's the last one, latest one, so I think maybe this year. Um, magnetic alloy decomposition, and then I'm involved in one together with Cathy Cash and Hong Ping Zhao from Electrical Engineering, where this SUSCHEM means like a subpart about sustainable chemistry. So we emphasize materials that only don't involve indium and things like that, but the sustainable elements, not toxic and so on. And it's about these materials. And uh, we have just a website that's, which you can look at there, which um, we're we've set up. So this is a screenshot from our website. And we need to still spiff it up a little bit. We haven't really released it yet. But you have all of these different materials. And you can go click on them and find out all the properties that we know about them at this point. So this brings us kind of to the question, well, if we, you know, Traditionally, an engineer, if he needs a material, he goes and looks what's available. And then he optimizes the best he can do. But the idea is if we want to discover new materials, how many materials are there already and that we know about? Well, in organic chemistry, this has been you know, the way of working since a long time. And with just a few, few elements, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, a few more, you can basically build millions of compounds, I think. And, um, but Typically, you just talk about molecules and sort of disordered looking arrangement of these atoms. In inorganic materials, we're typically talking about crystal structures. And there's, of course, a much wider variety of possibilities because we have many more atoms in the periodic table than in organic chemistry. So there are now a few of these various databases available, like the Inorganic Crystal Structure Database in, based in Karlsruhe is one of the famous ones. Um, there are a few other ones. There's the NIST gateway and so on, where you can find information of what compounds are out there. So for example, this ICSD lists about 2,000 crystal structures of just the elements. One element. There are about 34,000 or 35,000 for binary compounds, about 69,000 for ternary compounds, 68 for quaternary and quinternary, and in total, like, uh, you know, 149,000 materials. And 
um, there are like 9,000 different known prototypes, different crystal structures, but which are just decorated with different elements. Um, so a new trend is that uh, so some various computational physicists have now built this website like the Materials Project, which I think is based in Berkeley, um, where for a number of materials, they actually automatically computer generated, calculate the electronic band structure, a bunch of other properties, pictures of the crystal structure. So if you are interested, you can explore that, uh, what the properties of a material would be. Another example is OQMD, Open Quantum Materials Database, which is based at Northwestern University. Well, he was a graduate of Berkeley also. And it focuses kind of more on uh, phase diagrams and so on. And you can, again, go look what all of these things do. So the bottom line is there's a vast, un even with these 100,000 sort of compounds that are known, for many of the materials, the only thing we know is the crystal structure. We don't know anything else about, we don't even know if it's a metal or a semiconductor or an insulator, if it's magnetic or not. Um, and there are, of course, many ways that we can go and substitute and move the atoms around and make new combinations and um, make uh, possibly new materials. And to do that, we need to understand the structure property relationships. And we need new methods that can actually accurately and reliably predict these properties, um, also predict whether these materials that we can come up with, well, if we put these elements together, we'll have a perfect superconductor or magnet or something, but what if that material isn't stable, then, you know, uh, we need to find ways to synthesize them also. So that's all sort of the goals of this thing. So basically, this is uh, the landscape, right, the periodic table. We can go and try to put all of these elements together in all kinds of ways, and it's mind-boggling if you think about the combinatorics, how many possibilities there are, really. So, so what makes uh, prediction of materials possible? Well, first we have a basic understanding of the atomistic level. Um, it's all based on quantum mechanics, electricity and magnetism, and statistical mechanics. And so that's basically the field of solid state physics, which now more fashionably is called condensed matter physics, which sounds dense, but it just means, you know, not gases and liquid, but well, liquids are included. And, uh, you know, liquid crystals and all of these, everything that's not really a gas or a plasma. And so particularly in this field, this idea of first principles or ab initio theory is really, literally, will you tell me which atoms to pick in the periodic table? And we'll go calculate what the properties of the material are. So this is based on density functional theory, electronic band structure methods, pseudo-potential molecular dynamics, Monte Carlo simulations, and so on. So. Um, I was planning to talk a little bit about the various milestones that make this uh, possible. And then I'll go and show a few examples of what we have done in our work or what we are uh, combining with. So one of the pioneers or visionary people of this field is um, Dirac, who already in 1929 or something realized basically that it, for all of chemistry and all of biology, therefore, we know actually the interactions between the atoms, their electricity and magnetism. We have the laws in place, quantum mechanics, and so in principle all the rest is just computation. And, but he said that this leads to equations which are much too complicated to be soluble. So that's a widely used quote, but people not quote so often is that he also said, it therefore becomes desirable that approximate practical methods are developed in applying quantum mechanics so that we can do this without too much computation. Now, without too much computation is relative, right? <laughs> um, it's certainly quite different from 1929 to now. What if you had a blue jean computer or even just a laptop or your cell phone had more computational power than what Dirac had in his days? Uh, so, but it all goes back basically first to the Schrodinger equation, which maybe some of you have seen in your chemistry or physics course. So uh, we describe the, the uh, behavior of the electrons as a probability to find a particle at some position in time by solving for this wave function here. But what we really need is to solve this for many electrons. And then we have this many electron wave function, which is a very complicated thing because of the interaction between the electrons. And so 
Um, so the first thing we do is we freeze the nuclei. The nuclei are much heavier. They are the 600-pound gorilla, and the electrons are the little uh, flea that sits on top. And so the flea just follows the gorilla wherever it goes, so the electrons follow the nuclei. Um, it's three orders of, or four orders of magnitude difference in mass. And so we keep the nuclei fixed at first and solve for the electrons. The next big important step is actually that electrons are fermions. And fermions are asocial creatures. They try to stay away from each other. And that means that in each energy state, you can at most put two electrons, one with spin up and spin down. And so if you, that leads to sort of the basic principle of how you build up the whole periodic table, actually. But how do you deal with the interactions? Well, that was uh, this many body wave function, even for like a fairly simple molecule of, um, is, it becomes soon actually even impossible to storage. Even if you think of the size of the universe, you wouldn't be able to store the wave function. So, but the idea that Walter Cohn had, um, who passed away last year, unfortunately, he got the Nobel Prize in chemistry, although he's a physicist, of course, also, is that instead of working with the many electron wave function, everything is determined by the electron density. So there is this universal function of the density which determines the energy, whatever external potential produced by the nuclei you put it in. And again, extraordinary, already in 1930, our friend Dirac already predicted the whole state of the atom is completely determined by this electronic density. It's not necessary to specify the individual three-dimensional wave functions. He already knew that way before this thing from 1964. So the way we do things in practice is we sort of map the system of interacting electrons to a system of fictitious particles that don't interact but move in an effective potential instead of the uh, real potential. And this basically leads to that this effective potential then can be calculated from the density. And that's the idea of a self-consistent field. So we solve a Schrodinger equation for one electron at a time. We fill them up from the bottom up with their occupations, the way Pauli told us. And then once we have the density, we can calculate a new potential, which is just representing the average electrostatic interaction with all the other electrons. And a few other things like these effects that they stay out of each other's way because they repel each other. So that's the self-consistent field ID. And so then the other practical approximation maybe comes from John Slater, um, also way before um, you know, Walter Kohn, that you can basically, we know how to calculate this exchange correlation energy um, in an electron gas where the density is constant. So now we can apply it even if my density is not constant locally at each point and then calculate this thing. And so nowadays there are various um, uh, better approximations for that that people use. OK, so we also need periodic boundary conditions. And I'm not going to give a whole tier class on solid state physics in uh, half an hour, so let's skip that. So then there's the idea of pseudopotentials. The real electron wave forms have all of these fast wiggles because they have very high kinetic energy near each nucleus. But we replace it by a smooth wave function coming from a softer potential. And that allows us to treat only the valence electrons, only the outermost electrons that actually produce bonding between the atoms. The other way to do it is to sort of divide the world into regions where we know the solutions, like spherical regions around each atom and constant in between. That's called the muffin tin potential, because it looks like a tin that you bake muffins in. And um, then one can use sort of linearized methods or nonlinear muffet in orbital. This was my postdoc advisor back in Stuttgart a time ago. And so all of these methodologies which have developed over the last you know, decades allow us now to really make this calculation, this vision of the Raka reality. So this leads to a bunch of codes. And you see, most of them are actually based in Europe, although um, some of the technology was maybe first developed here in the States. Um, so there's uh, Siesta in Spain, Quantum Espresso in Italy. Uh, there's the famous VASP code and Wien 2 k both in Vienna. Um, FLIR is the European full potential APW method, Amsterdam density functional theory. Albinit is based in Belgium, my home country, but it was first developed here in the States, and among other at Cornell University and Corning Glass Company. Uh, we contribute actually to this code Questal, which 
is based in London now by Mark van Schilfkarde. Um, but he developed this first in Stuttgart when he was a, a postdoc there and then at SRI. And he was for a long time at Arizona State University, but eventually now is at King's College London. But we contribute to this code, actually. Um, so there are a few in the States, too. Of course, there's Berkeley Center, where there is the GW Berkeley coat. I don't know why it looks like a donkey, but that's what they always show it like. And there are a few, various few other places. But actually, DOE, basic energy science, is kind of worried that the bulk of the action seems to be in Europe and wants to have more com methods development happening in this country. So um, what kind of properties can we calculate? Well, we have our atoms fixed. So we can first calculate what the bonding is between the energy electrons, because we can calculate the total energy. Um, then we can move our atoms a little bit, so we can get forces, force constants, and there were vibrational mode. We can calculate elastic costs, piezoelectric, spontaneous polarization. We can look at transition between these levels, calculate optical properties. The electrons have a spin, so we can calculate all kinds of things related to spin and therefore magnetism. We can see how the electrons move around statistically, mechanically, and do transport properties. Um, so we look at bulk crystals, interfaces, point defects, nano scale systems that don't exist in nature will be put together, and we also can deal to some extent with disordered systems. So the current challenges have to do with uh, this basic theory is for the ground state, but we also, in most cases, are very interested in excitations. And we're, for strongly correlated systems, these methods do not quite work yet. So for a big part of the periodic table with 3D transition metals, we have trouble. And so the other problems have to do with going to multiple length scales from atomistic to continuum models and multiple time scales. For example, if you want to predict the phase transition, these are rare events. Even if we can assimilate uh, the initial time scales are of the order of 10 of femtoseconds, if we want to calculate something that takes a minute, well, that takes too long still, even with the best HPC computers that we have available now. So um, in terms of excitations, one defines actually the energy bands in terms of a photoemission experiment where you knock out an electron of a system, or inverse photoemission where you bring it in, and then um, basically, the idea for that is that if you add an electron to an interacting system, it's like adding a drop of water to a puddle of water. It's not just you added a drop of water, but you create a splash, basically, and all of these other excitations. And all of these many electron effects are hidden in this so-called self-energy, which we like to put, write uh, Feynman diagrams for. And then that allows us to actually really calculate this dynamic interaction of what you add a particle, what really is going on in the system. So let me, uh, in the last five minutes, go through a few of the things we're doing. So one of the projects we're working on is these heterovalence 2,4 nitrides. So the idea there is that gallium nitride gives us all of these nice blue LEDs. But there are still problems with making it more efficient. So one of the things we're exploring is if you replace a group three element with group two and four, like zinc and germanium, you have the same electron count. And what are the properties of these new materials? How does it depend on how the blue and green atoms, the zinc and germanium, are ordered or disordered, and so on? So that's the topic of our DMREF together with Kathy Cash and Hong Ping Zhao. So here are the band gaps versus lattice constants of the family of the, two, the three nitrides. And then here are zinc silicon nitride, zinc chimeno, zinc tin nitride. Zinc tin nitride, we predicted its properties before it was first synthesized. Uh, recently, in the last two years, we've added all of these compounds and these ones, where we start to build up You know what are all the possibilities there. Um, so then what can we do with that? We can study, for example, in connection with the experiments. So the experiments at the moment give crystals that look like these long needles or little flat platelets uh, with Raman spectroscopy shining a laser on this spot here, like I'm doing now. <laughs> you can basically make energy losses which correspond to the vibrational modes. So this is what they measure. This is what we calculate. And now we can go and say each of these peaks what kind of dance the atoms are doing to interpret what's going on there. Um, we also study how the electrons localize near defects, like if here a nitrogen atom is mixing, missing, then 
the waveforms are kind of localized. We predict that the main defects in this material are germanium that goes, sits on a zinc site or zinc on a germanium site, and then we can predict where these two would be in equilibrium, how many concentrations of each of the defects there would be in equilibrium at the growth temperature, whether this material would be p-type and n-type, and, and so on. Um, here is another example, uh, halite perovskites. So the perovskite crystal structure has basically a cube here with, um, in our case, uh, cesium on the corners, uh, tin in the center, and halogens like iodine or chlorine um, or bromine on the corners here. And all these uh, octahedrons are corner shared. And the unique property of this material is that the tin S and iodine P states sort of form bonding and anti-bonding states. So this top state here has a lot of um, tin S in it. And this state is almost purely tin P. And so optical properties from here to here are uh, possible because they, it's at the same K point. That means momentum conservation. But it's also direct in real space because it happens essentially on the same tin atom. That makes optical absorption here at around 1.5 EV or 1.3 EV very strong. So this is a material that very strongly absorbs light, much better than silicon. And therefore, it's actually a good material for uh, solar cells. And so in fact, very related materials based on methyl ammonium lead iodide, where now the cesium atom is replaced by a big organic ion and tin by lead, have um, very long diffusion length, so they have strong optical absorption. Once you create an electron hole pair, they don't bind together because you have very small exciton binding energy. Then the electron and hole can move like a micron far without recombining. So this makes, and these materials are very easy to fabricate. You basically pour two yellow powders dissolved in a liquid together, heat it a little bit on, a, on your um, hot plate, and you, voila, you have a black material that absorbs light like crazy, and you have a solar cell. Uh, problem is, they have lead in them, and we don't want lead in them because it turns out so well. So they, they well, these materials started to first be, be made in 2009. They had 3% efficiencies. Now they're already at efficiencies. This is already a few years old. By now we are at 20%, so comparable to silicon solar cells. But as I mentioned, they have um, basically some problems. They have lead in them. And also, instead of having this crystal structure, this perfect um, perovskite structure, these uh, ions here actually are a little bit too small for the space they sit in. And that makes these octahedra rotate. And all of that's still fine. But sometimes they also start then sharing uh, edges in the octahedra. And then you get a band structure that's basically very bad for solar cells. And so the problem is that this can this kind of structure is actually the stable phase. So you can make it in this phase, and it's a good solar cell. But if you leave it there, especially in moist air, it's going to eventually become this and then decompose. And then you're stuck with stuff that contains lead that's soluble in the environment in water. So that's the last thing we want. Um, so OK, so we're working towards trying to find replacements. We you may have noticed I work on the tin compounds, and we're also exploring germanium and so on, rather than lead to avoid the lead. And we're trying to basically, from our calculations, try to understand how you go from here to there, and what is this, uh, the relative stability of these different phases, and so on. OK, so another last example is an example of materials that are basically 2D. Uh, so these are, this is a material V205, vanadium pentoxide. And you see these little slivers here. Those are just a few atomic layers thick. And nonetheless, my colleagues here can make contacts to them. And they measure, for example, that the uh, connectivity is, or the mobility of the electrons, how f easily they move under the influence of an electric field, is like 10 times higher in one direction than the other. And this is related to the underlying crystal structure which is quite a unique structure. You have these layers that are weakly interacting, but in the layers you have these chains. And so it turns out, so the way you make these tiny, very thin samples is actually with literally the scotch tape method. You peel off layers, and then you put them on silicon. And so that's the same way you make graphene and molybdenum disulfide and so on. We're not quite down to one monolayer yet, but we'll be getting there, I'm sure. 
So what happens is that the connectivity is much higher in this direction than in this direction along these chains here. And we're starting to explore uh, what's happening with that. Um, so here is another one of these plots that probably I should explain. And these are energy versus momentum of the electrons. And these are all filled. These are the oxygen-related states. These are the vanadium states. And the unique thing is that you have this separated band from the rest here that the electrons can move in it. Normally, this will be empty. But if you dope it a little bit, you have electrons in here. And it's these electrons that give you this unique conductivity. So you can dope it by putting sodium in the structure. That gives one extra electron. So this band becomes half filled. And if that happens, actually, this splits in spin up and spin down states. And then they form anti-ferromagnetic ordering. So each of these vanadium alternates spin down, spin up, spin down, spin up. So now you have an anti-ferromagnet. And so what we predict is, for example, if you would have a little bit less than half filling, so suppose with a scanning microscope tip you could pull out a few electrons, then you would go from anti-ferromagnetic to ferromagnetic. So that would mean that if you scan over this thing, you could locally sort of flip the spins from being anti-parallel to, to parallelly oriented and make little memory devices and so on. But we're not there yet. This is just an example of how, what the kind of things that these computations can do. So in conclusion, it's now possible to predict properties of materials just starting from actual quantum mechanics and the laws of nature that we know. And this is possible thanks to decades of algorithm development, understanding the methods of how to solve these complicated equations I showed you. And at the same time, the enormous development, of course, of computing power. And in recent years, this leads basically to a new strategy in engineering. Instead of uh, the idea is really to design materials you need instead of working with what's available. And that will relies on producing big databases and then sophisticated computational power to search through all of these databases to find the material and actually go directed searches to make the material you need for a particular combination of properties you want. So with that, thank you for your attention. Thanks to the HPC folks for allowing me to use their computer there. Thanks to my students and postdocs who, of course, have all done, done all the work, my colleagues, and so on, and funding from NSF, DOE, and the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. Thank you. Questions? Thank you so much. Uh, is there any questions? So you talked about designing the materials you need as opposed to going out and looking for what's already existing. Can you maybe talk a little bit in more detail of, say, I come to you and I say, I want a material with such and such a property, the exact workflow of how you'd say, OK, I have these properties. How do I then compute a material that would have such properties if we can't just pick one out yeah. of our database? So it, well, it depends, right? If, it's a, if you say a material with a certain band cap, that's a property that's easy to calculate. Some other properties are more complex. So if you say, I want a new ferroelectric, but it needs to be at the same time ferromagnetic, and it also needs to be stable at this temperature, and it shouldn't corrode, and all of these things. Some of these things are very involved properties. So what people then do is sort of use our general knowledge of defining a proxy. So instead of the real property you want, we define something we can calculate. Then we go out and take, for example, all these atoms in this 150,000 crystal structures database, we narrow it down already to a, a, a treatable kind of subset. And then we go and calculate and order them according to a bunch of different properties that seem to be correlated with what ultimately you want. And then we, we go set this off the computer. We set up a program that uh, with no person ever is involved. It calculates these band structure properties and everything for you completely automated. And then we go back and search through that and find the best candidates. And then we go and refine our calculations and do more detail until we zoom in on the material you want. That's basically sort of the strategy that people follow these days. Now, I'm not doing that much in that area. Uh, to be honest, we have at the moment like a fairly small family of materials like these 2 4 nitrites. But for example, in LEDs, there is a thing called the green gap. So it turns out if you want to make green LEDs, 
um, you need to put more and more indium in your indium gallium lighter. Indium is expensive, and also the more you put in, the more strain you produce in the material, so it becomes hard to do. If you come from the other end, you also cannot make them. So we, it turns out that this cadmium germanium nitrate, one of these materials we came up, I thought about it ahead of time that it, from looking at the electronegativities and so on, what guessing it would be close to green. And in fact, when we do the calculation, it is close to green. In the band cap would correspond to green light. So, um, so yeah, in some cases, for some kind of properties, we can directly kind of using our knowledge of how this all works, go and predict what the properties are. But it depends on how involved the property is that you're trying to optimize. OK, that's a great presentation. Uh, I think we thank uh, Dr. Lambrick for the explanation. That's a very quick uh, explanation about first principles. Uh, someone said to me, if you don't do calculation using the first principles, you are actually starting from an arbitrary standpoint. Because everything is always above the the first principle. So with that, uh, thank you. Uh, and we have a gift for you. And the next presenter is actually uh, Mike Worf, uh, who is uh, the assistant director. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again. Um, as Hadrian mentioned, my name is Mike Worf, and uh, my talk is on research computing the team and the cyber infrastructure resources we have here at Case Western Reserve University. To come up, great. So our CCI research computing was founded in 2004 by our senior director, Roger Beofield, and our CIO at that time, Lev Gonick. Um, throughout the years, our mission has always been to support and enhance the research mission here at the university through responsive service, enabling infrastructure, collaborative partnerships, and innovative solutions. We do this through two foci. Um, the first being our staff members who are science domain experts and um, also um, technologists. And um, the second foci is the operations of our software infrastructure. In all of this, we are dedicated to delivering objective technology agnostic solutions and the championing of research lab needs, which is important, through partnerships locally, regionally, and nationally. So these are some numbers um, from last year in regards to our production capacity as well as our scholarly activity. The thing that I want to highlight here was, um, and Sue mentioned this earlier this morning, the 80 publications that utilized our um, resources here on campus. Um, thank you for everyone that contributed to that number. We greatly appreciate it and it impacts um, the capital and everything else that we have in regards to university resources. So, this is all possible by the operations of cyber infrastructure resources and our client services, which I will um, talk about now. So today we provide the following cyber infrastructure for basic and clinical research conducted here at the university. The first and the most mature is our high performance computing resource. Um, if you've never used it before, think about what it is. Um, you have resources available that's larger than your desktop and that generally means more CPUs, memory disks that can be used to get your work done. So today we have two production clusters. Our HPC is named Redcat. You can see in the back of me um, the amount of GPUs, CPUs, RAM, storage, um, network, and the different node types that we have in here. We also have a second system that's more um, geared towards Hadoop. We still call it HPC just simply because of the way that it's been configured with memory and cores. Um, larger HPC systems are usually have a lot more storage, and they're commonly termed as data lakes now these days. So both of our HPC clusters are constantly refreshed and guided by our governance committee. Our HPC is medium sized and normally fits the needs of our campus. However, larger sized jobs are diverted to NSFs exceed um, consortium and other um, cyber infrastructure resources such as Ohio Supercomputing Center. M is going to talk about that um, next. So if you want to start working with HPC, we encourage you to sign up to explore the, custom, um, the cluster's capabilities. We currently have two tiers, guests, a free tier, and members. Becoming a member enables you to have additional support and resources such as higher number of processors and longer wall time. 
You can become a member through an annual fee or hardware purchase. Boilerplate language is available for inclusion in your proposals. Email us for more details. So the next thing I want to talk about is our science and research network and its motivations. We all know that networks are an essential part of data intensive science and performance is critical. UTech has made great strides in committing resources to providing a, a robust campus network. Our CCI has also made efforts in this area by providing an effective long haul network and engineering resources on campus to help aid a historically difficult problem for most labs. So, our CCI, um, through an award that I'll mention in a second, has created what's known as a Science DMZ for long haul transfers. The Science DMZ um, has four key concepts. One is a network architecture explicitly designed for high performance transfer dedicated to scientific research alone. Um, the use of dedicated systems, such as a data transfer node, as well as a way to measure the performance too, known as a perf sonar, um, provides um, measurement. And then the fourth one is um, security policies and enforcement that enables you to have frictionless transfers between what's on campus and off campus. And this was um, sourced from ESNet, um, the Energy Sciences Network, and they have a lot of depth and breadth of experience of um, having long haul networks just because of the nature of large scale computing that science, energy sciences need. So, the Science DMZ mostly on campus is used for these four um, use cases. Um, one is utilizing Globus to transfer data back and forth from research labs to the cluster or from the cluster to other federal you know, government resources such as um, Stampede Attack or um, San Diego Supercomputing Center. Um, we also, at least on our side, see a lot of data transfer from ge the genomic data commons. Um, in Chicago, as well as Cyverse at Arizona State. Um, we also have started to work with many labs on campus to do instrument data transfers using Globus, too. So, as I mentioned before, this has been possible through and two NSF awards. One was the original Science DMZ, and then the second one is through our CC um, DNI Engineer Award, um, which has brought us Cindy Martin to the team in order to help different labs across campus be able to move data faster and more efficiently. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, our research storage services. Our CCI understands the needs to provide robust scalable data storage. We currently offer the following portfolio of storage solutions. So today we have um, three different systems essentially. One is called Panassas, which everyone's used to through Scratch and Home. Um, it provides about 170 terabytes of um, storage. And um, that's done through the Panassas parallel file system. The second part is our research storage, which right now is about 700 terabytes, not petabytes, mistake right there, um, usable distributed between two locations, meaning that we have two different um, repositories of the data that's housed there. One sits in our primary KSL data center, and the second one sits in our Crawford data center. And the data that's kept in those are replicated nightly to ensure if one of those pieces of equipment fails, we can be able to pull back the data that's being replicated. Um, our third option is known as Research Archive, and that provides object storage that will then go to tape. Um, the tape can then be kept at your lab, on site here at the KSL Data Center, um, which is the library, or be shipped off site to an archive. Um, faculty members can purchase or lease multiple terabytes of storage space as needed, um, and there's also multiple file sharing protocols, including Globus, that can enable you to transfer data. So the next thing I want to talk about is the secure research environment, and it's really our final piece of cyber infrastructure that I'm going to discuss during this talk. Um, the SRE provides a controlled private cloud for processing and storing regulated data. If you have data generated by any of the hospitals that are affiliates with us, so clinic, um, university hospitals, or the VA, you really need to start thinking about putting um, your data in that environment. Um, the secure research environment has been vetted by um, the clinic as well as UH and is now being, um, it's now being recommended that you um, include that within your IRB awards, I'm sorry, your IRB proposals. 
um, please contact us if you want to know more information about that. So one of the other things I'd like to talk about today is our client services. We provide many opportunities to partner and um, we try to do that both at the pre-award side, so when you are um, creating proposals, we, we definitely like to help you by making sure that whatever science you're doing, we have the right, neck, the right cyber infrastructure created so that you can get your job done. Um, around those topics, beyond consultation and award support, we also have um, people on staff that can do database design, visualization, and code optimizations. And there's also concierge services for going out to the cloud, such as AWS, as well as partnering with regional and, and national resources, such as Exceed and OSC. So I spoke about many things pretty quickly today. Please remember, if you have any questions, please contact us here or, while, um, or virtually through our email addresses and, and websites. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, I'll be speaking briefly about uh, resources that are available uh, that our team works to uh, help you make use of uh, at the Ohio Supercomputing Center through the extreme science and engineering discovery environment, through the Science Gateway Community Institute, and the Globus service that Mike mentioned a time or two. Okay, I'm more comfortable with that. Okay. So this is not an exhaustive listing of national or regional resources, but these are the resources that we're most closely coupled with and are better positioned to direct you efficiently. Um, and I'm not giving kind of the statistics of what these different services are. The summary is that they are uh, providing high performance computing and storage on scales that exceed what we have here at CASE. So uh, for the most part, if you're thinking of scaling up your work, then you would consider resources such as the ones I'll be describing here. My report today uh, is mainly focused on trends that are affecting the services being offered and the kind of development focus that these uh, external resources are, are taking, partly under NSF guidance and partly under uh, guidance and feedback from researchers who have been using the services for quite a while. So in short, there's a consensus that there's a broader user base that should be served that is not currently being served because of barriers against either ease of use or effective use for a particular, uh, for a particular investigation. So all of these services are working to um, promote research and technical collaboration within domain specialties and you'll kind of see these themes play out as, as I go through the, the remaining slides. The Ohio Supercomputing Center is located in uh, Columbus. It's co-located with Ohio State University. And the services provided are uh, this, this list here on your left. Um, our case HPC obtains our uh, Intel compiler licenses from OSC. And we also help researchers make direct use of allocations on, on the resources there. Uh, of note, a new updated primary cluster, the Owens cluster, named for Jesse Owens, was dedicated just last month. Now, an interesting tool that OSC has been working on for quite some time is meant to reduce the, the barrier of use for high performance computing systems. And the recent effort there is to take this and um, make the resource publicly available. So in the spirit of open source, 
there is open on demand. You see that Ohio Supercomputing Center has their own GitHub site for distributing code. The summary on what they're trying to accomplish is that through developing a set of applications, the user can interact uh, without really having to, to hit the Linux command line. It's not that the option is withdrawn, it's that you can proceed without having to use the command line. Now this also translates into using your handheld device. If you want to drop to the bottom of the list of, uh, of applications, you can at the very least uh, display your job queue. You could also interact um, if you needed to change something in the allocation request that your job is looking for. Uh, full documentation for what the OOD, the open on-demand resource, uh, is available at the GitHub site with the link at the bottom of the screen. So I want to speak uh, next about the uh, Exceed resource, cyber infrastructure on a national scale. Um, the main notion here, and, and we heard references in um, Irene Qualter's talk this morning about Exceed. This is kind of an NSF um, um, focus for computational cyber infrastructure. Allocations for use of Exceed resources are uh, made through a peer review process. Every quarter uh, there's an open call that, that lasts for a month and allocations are submitted. They're peer reviewed by other users of the resource, um, typically uh, domain experts. The review process is, is quick. Within a week, you get feedback. Um, and by and large, people don't get turned down. But what happens is your, your allocation levels may be adjusted um, to ensure that all of the people who put in allocations are able to use the resource. Now, Exceed operates a campus champions program. Uh, I am one of the campus champions uh, here at Case to help you access Exceed resources. Um, your co-host and moderator for today, Hadrian Johari, is really the principal campus champion. And we also have an emeritus campus champion, uh, Roger Bielefeld, who played this role from the early, early days. So to give you a scope of what Exceed represents, um, I've created a busy graphic on top of a map that I found um, uh, through the Exceed resource. You can see outlined the Internet 2 network structure that makes for the high-speed interconnects between the facilities around the nation. Um, I've indicated with uh, blue and orange triangles the exceed compute and storage resources around the country. Um, those sites that provide both, uh, we start with the uh, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. Um, there's also the, the uh, what's called TAC, the uh, Texas something or other advanced computing center. And then uh, the, super, er, the San Diego Supercomputing Center in the west. There are standalone um, uh, compute resources, for instance, at Louisiana State University. There's this Intel architecture for kind of co-processing that is offered as an alternative to graphical uh, GPU-based uh, acceleration called the, the MIC architecture. LSU has a cluster based on that that supplements the similar cluster at uh, Texas. Um, from the user uh, ease of use perspective, Exceed operates a user portal. You can see at the top indications that they are also trying to meet the needs of users who want to uh, be able to interact with their job requests uh, through tablets or handheld devices. Their portal provides an overview of what are the current status of resources. 
um, as well as what you see here, some current um, like past seven days statistics. So Exceed managing resources at multiple sites wants to make information about the resources and about your actual use of those resources available to you in a simpler way. They've not yet taken the same step that OSC has taken with their open on demand program, but you can anticipate, in fact, that they'll be working kind of in that direction. So Exceed does not refer to the facilities themselves, but Exceed refers to the organization that kind of manages access, uh, establishes the uh, kind of strategic planning for the overall network and works to make the resource more effective for the community. The first proposal or the first project of Succeed, uh, of Exceed, uh, ended last year. They were uh, renewed for another five-year period. So now, really, a primary focus of what they refer to as Exceed 2.0 is to broaden access to these resources brought in in the sense of uh, uh, they like to say deepen and extend the use of the computing infrastructure, um, new communities of scientists, as well as existing users, um, advancing the ecosystem by creating kind of open source tools to enhance the use and uh, of course focus on implementing all of this while maintaining secure and reliable infrastructure. Probably the, well, when I look at Exceed and I think about say taking a code developed locally and porting it to some large scale system where I might be looking to run over hundreds or potentially thousands of compute nodes, this is what I like, the extended collaborative support services. So you can enter into, um, in essence, a contracted relationship to have uh, the support of a skilled worker for an extended period. You can, you can request for up to a year at a time. Um, and you can see listed a sampling of the uh, research domains that these experts are familiar with. Um, some of the experts span research domains and technologies and techniques, or some subset of that. The access to these services is done in the same way as access to the compute resources, which is to say that you make an allocation, but in fact, uh, just by contacting uh, one of your local campus champions, we can help expedite the consultation process so that you can scope you know, in advance what resources you might best benefit from and then get the application for the allocation in um, so that we don't have to kind of churn back and forth um, in that process. Okay. Now, out of the Exceed experience and uh, building on one of the themes that, that Walter mentioned in his talk, for example, the materials project, um, there's the, uh, a new initiative, um, another five-year funded program similar to Exceed has been launched. This is the Science Gateways Community Institute. Now, this is really meant to leverage not just the computational resource, but algorithms and methods that are developed by people uh, to accomplish specific computations within a domain subject area or multi-domain subject area. The point being that NSF is reacting to motivations coming from um, coming from Congress and coming from the OSTP that say that you, you needn't necessarily be a computational scientist to use these facilities. So domain knowledge experts, 
do not also have to be computational science experts. That's really the core uh, motivation for developing the Science Gateways Community Institute. Now, similar to Exceed, they offer extended developer support because this is an area that really kind of isn't in the research domain, right? We, we don't typically have people in our research groups who either have the skills or we want to give the time, you know, to develop some kind of web interface for leveraging algorithms and, and computational resources. So that's built into this uh, Science Gateways Community Institute. In addition, or, well, let's stick with in addition, there's a recognition that the tools that are developed and then shared through these gateways should also be shared. So the code base that allows for some algorithm to be implemented. You know, if it's written according to, um, you know, object-oriented uh, principles, you know, these things can be packaged and made available for reuse. Now, one final aspect of the Science Gateway Communities Institute is the sense that science gateways then, because they would serve to bring people together who are domain experts, but who have a range of computational skills, it's really a community engagement and community building exercise as well. So this is built into the program. Um, I invite you to uh, dig a little more deeply by going to sciencegateways.org. Okay. So just a couple more minutes. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about, um, in part, this question of data sharing and data publishing. We've mentioned the, the Globus service a couple of times, and it's now a pretty well-established service that I think many people are familiar with for promoting high-speed data transfer. But it turns out that the tool that Globus has developed um, has also facilities for doing data sharing. So it's not just something that you use to move data from point A to point B. You can also set um, uh, permissions for people that you want to share your data with to be able to access it and move it on their own to their own destination. Globus has moved in recent years to implementing in common federated authentication so that when we manage our identities in this extended uh, uh, space of resources, we have one less identity to manage. Globus used to operate on an independent you know, login and password credential, but they've suppressed that now. And so if your, well, your case credentials are, are now uh, something that you can use to access the Globus service, just your, your case ID and your single sign-on. So the final comment is about um, a publishing service that Globus has, um, is now offering. It's not quite a standalone service that you can just plug into, however. Um, so Globus's data transfer and sharing service, if you kind of look in the middle of this diagram, it, it serves as an organizing core infrastructure for data publishing. But the individual researcher then, um, item, item one, the individual researcher needs to think about their own needs. Uh, item two, you need to create metadata that helps in the process of discovery of the data that you'll be publishing. So that might be something you do on your own. It might be something you do in consultation with research service librarians at KSL or members of the research computing team. And then uh, working with members of our team or possibly uh, collaborators of your own, you look to find the location where you want to host your data. So like I say, we can help with that. Um, 
but I, I like to call this self-catering, okay? You know, for the full experience or to accomplish the state of publishing, um, there's the role for the, for the thoughtful uh, consideration of the research group leader to determine how to package together the results of the, uh, of the research work appropriately for discovery and for, and for sharing. Okay. So to, to kind of back up and summarize a little bit, Ohio Supercomputing Center and Exceed um, certainly provide next scale computational and storage systems um, at, a, at a scale above what Crew HPC provides. There's an emphasis on lowering barriers for the use of these resources. That emphasis uh, involves interface development efforts, um, both for science gateways and for improving ease of use. And whereas Globus offers a partnership to perform data publishing in the spirit of public access, um, Exceed and the Science Gateways are concerned about that same issue. So there's really a, a wealth of resources to address these issues. I think coming from, um, coming from a research background myself, I don't like to cast these solely in the context of uh, you know, mandates or expectations from funding agencies. I think that each of us as a researcher can recognize the value of publicly providing access to our, to our research final products, but also to some of the intermediate products that really do sustain, um, you know, through the ability to reproduce our work, um, you know, th the most effective research communities that we can. So to help you uh, with items like this, please consider consulting, and thanks for your attention this afternoon. So now we are going to talk, this is our flash talk sessions, and then we have accepted three flash talks. The presenters are Kabilar Gunalan, uh, Haotian Jiang, and Nicholas Meling. So each presenter will briefly talk about their innovative research project for which they will be provided with five to eight minutes. So I will stand up after each flash talk to let the presenter know that they have one more minute to wrap, wrap up the talk. So with that, first I would like to invite Kabilar Gunalan to the, on the podium to, to start the presentation. The topic, the title of his presentation is Pathway Selective Deep Brain Stimulation Derived from Patient Specific Models. Welcome, Kavi. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak here today. <clears throat> My name is, uh, like Sanjay said, my name is Kavi Gunalan, um, and I am a, a MD-PhD candidate in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, and my advisor is Cameron McIntyre. And our lab's real focus is to understand how deep brain stimulation works, and the talk I'm talking about today is how we use the HPC to understand which axon pathways are activated during deep brain stimulation. So deep brain stimulation is this med medical technology and uh, more specifically, this implantable medical device that's used to treat many ne neurological disorders, including uh, Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease is a drug, it's a disorder that's initially treated by medications initially, but after medications no longer work, uh, they have a couple of different surgical options, and one is deep brain stimulation. So uh, in this image behind me, you can see the patient that's implanted with this uh, electrode, and there's a wire that connects the electrode, if you can see the cursor, yep. So the electrode's right here, and then they connect a wire underneath the skin to a pacemaker-like device that sits under the, in the chest. And so once this 
the electrodes implanted, the systems implanted, the clinician can choose the simulation settings to use. So they can choose the electrode, conductive electrode contact to use, so zero, one, two, or three. And then they can change the amplitude and duration of the stimulation to improve the patient's symptoms. And the way right now they choose the patient's settings is by uh, trial and error. So they iteratively select the electrode contact and then uh, iteratively increase the amplitude and see how the patient does. And so they eventually settle on a contact, amplitude, and, and duration or pulse width that uh, is most therapeutically, therapeutically beneficial for the patient. So let me show you an example of how this technology works in a patient. So this will be a video that plays. And this patient here on the left in the red shirt has tremor in their right hand. And they already actually have the system implanted. But initially when the video turns on, they, the system's off. And then the clinician, one of our collaborators here at University Hospitals, he'll wirelessly turn the stimulator on and you'll see the patient's symptoms uh, disappear. So the patient initially has tremor in their right extremity, right extremity. And then the clinician wirelessly turns, off, turns on the pacemaker and the tremor goes away. So we know this technology works, but from a science perspective, we don't really, really understand why it works. So our lab focuses on building computational or computer models to understand what cells in the brain are being activated with stimulation. So the cells in the brain that we're interested in are called neurons. They consist of a cell body and a projection called the axon. And the way cells transmit information from one cell to another is in the form of electrical signals or what are called on the right here, ash potentials. And with deep brain stimulation, more and more theoretical and experimental evidence suggests that you can actually artificially create these action potentials in these axons, which are then resulting in the therapeutic benefit that we see in these patients. So the, result, the end result is their tremor stops. So we build uh, computational models to understand which axons are being activated in the patient's brain. So they start with the patient's MRI, and we um, can localize where the electrode is in that patient. And this green structure is just where the neurosurgeon targets. And our computational models consist of three main components. They consist of calculating the voltage that's generated by the electrode, modeling the trajectory of these different axons, and the activity of these axons can be modeled with sets of differential equations, which we would then solve. And so we could stimulate the axon in the middle with the voltage that's generated by the electrode and see how that axon responds, whether it generates an action potential or not, by solving those differential equations. And so this video will show you uh, that this axon in our models responds to stimulation. And so it's color coded here and right now it sits at a negative potential, but in response to this stimulus, it'll generate an action potential and the color will change and you'll see the traces on the right hand side as well uh, generate an action potential. So ash potential is initiated here and then it propagates in both directions with the change in color. So this is for one axon, but axons in the brain are kind of bundled into what, what are called axonal pathways. And so we want to know, of a pathway, is it activated or not? So in this following video, I'll turn up the voltage. And on the left-hand side, you'll see the color of that voltage um, in the tissue increase. And on the right-hand side, as the voltage increases, you'll see more and more uh, axons turn red, meaning they generate ash potentials. So as voltage is increased, you can see the spread in the tissue. And then in response to the stimulation at higher and higher amplitudes, more and more axons are getting activated. So you can quantify what percent of this pathway um, or how many of these axons are activated. And so you can plot this in a 2D plot, this data. And so on the x-axis you have how many of these axons are, uh, or as a stimulation, sorry. On the x-axis you have the stimulation amplitudes. As you increase it, you can quantify how many of these axons are activated. And so um, I've showed you, you can calculate it for one axon and you can calculate it for a thousand axons. But the difference in computation time is dramatic. And that's, this is where the HPC comes in play. So the, to calculate activation um, or the response of an axon to, for, for one axon, it takes about 10 minutes. But when you do this for a thousand axons in this one pathway, it takes about 175 hours. And you'll notice the log scale on the y-axis here. But when you, so, yeah, sorry. So for one axon, it takes 10 minutes, and then a thousand axons, it takes 175 hours. And with the use of the HPC, we can get it to right above uh, an hour. 
And so in addition to this one pathway, there are actually five or six pathways that we're interested in. And so you can imagine that the computation time to calculate the activation of these different pathways would uh, increase dramatically. And so we can build those same type of acti activation curves for all these different pathways. So as you increase the stimulation amplitude, you can see how much of each pathway gets activated. And for this patient, the clinician, before even seeing any of these models, they determined that two volts was therapeutically beneficial. So that their symptoms were controlled with two volts. So using our models, we can infer that you need to activate a little bit of this pathway, a little bit of this pathway, and a lot of the hyperdirect pathway. And you can extend this theoretical analysis. So we're always looking at contact two here. So this is contact two. But you can look at how activation happens for the different contacts. And this is our lab in the field is just getting to the point where we can say, OK, let's use our models to target stimulation towards these two pathways here. Or let's choose stimulation settings that target these three pathways here. And let's see how the patient's symptoms improve. So we can try to get a better mechanistic understanding of how stimulation of different pathways improves patient's symptoms. With the ho overall hopeful goal of increasing the efficacy of these, uh, of these therapies. So just to re reiterate the point, for one pathway, we uh, reduce computation time from 175 hours to just over an hour. So you can imagine looking at five pathways, looking at four contacts, looking at five patients, it could take up to two years of computation time if we didn't have the cluster. But that's reduced down the matter of a factor of a few days uh, with the HPC. So with that, I would like to thank my advisor, Cameron McIntyre, um, those members of the lab, all members of the lab, uh, specifically Ross Anderson, Brian Howell, Angela Naker, and then everyone involved with the HPC, and then specifically Emily, Hadrian, Sanjaya, Mike, and Mecca, who've answered my numerous emails and helped me out a lot. So thank you. I would like to invite Hao Tian Jiang, and his title is, I think he just changed his title a little bit. So it's a distributed deep learning system on Android devices. Before I begin my uh, flash talk, I want to emphasize that uh, this is our previous conference paper. We published our conference paper based on our uh, simulation result. Uh, currently, I changed the title to the uh, distributed to uh, a distributed system on real Android platform. But this power, uh, but this PowerPoint is built on our uh, previous conference paper, and uh, but uh, the same concept. So, um, a collaborative, privacy-preserving, deep learning system in distributed mobile environment. Um, as we all know, uh, in recent, uh, healthcare data is exploded, um, and uh, 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 and um, one from 2013 to the 2020, the healthcare data is increased in, increased from 500, uh, 500 exabyte to 2.5. Uh, from uh, sorry, from it's increased from the half exabyte to 2.5 exabyte. And uh, we should notice that one exabyte is equal to one billion gigabyte. So it is a huge, huge data. And uh, in order to make use of this data, and uh, people, a lot of people use the data mining technique, for example, deep learning, to uh, f want, want, they want to find some interest, interesting information from this huge data. Uh, the data can be genome data, drug data, or assay or clinical data, and uh, people may use deep learning or some other machine learning technique to do some data mining. And uh, in general, in order to do data mining, the prerequisite is we need to have the huge data. And uh, traditionally, people collect the clinical data from each local, for example, from each patient and uh, store their patient raw data, or in other words, private data, in a central data warehouse. And uh, then people will uh, build some training model based on this data. But there's a problem. 
The problem is privacy issue. From 2000 and uh, uh, based on the predicted result uh, from 2015 to in the in the future 2019, the uh, tw over 25 million patients will have their medical information stolen. Six million patients will become medical identity theft victim, and four million patients will pay out of pocket costs related to the medical identity theft. Once the patient reveal their raw data to no matter hospital or government or their private doctor, they cannot the patient cannot control their data anymore because their raw data has already been revealed to public. And uh, if the doctor can use their data legally, everything is okay. But what if the doctor sells their data without the permission? What if the hacker hacked the data warehouse? So once these bad things happen, the privacy information of the patient may be stolen and uh, may be used illegally. So how to protect the privacy of the patient or user? Um, this is the question. And uh, so we solve this problem based on the deep learning framework. As we all know, the Deep, uh, deep, deep, uh, the deep learning is conducted by the gradient design technique. And uh, we train over, uh, given the initial model, we update the model using gradient descent. And uh, during the training process, we will generate a lot of gradient. And uh, although the raw data will reveal our privacy information like age, family, or uh, female or male, or mar mar uh, marriage status, but the gradient will not. Nobody can find any concrete information from the gradient because no, nobody can understand gradient. The gradient is like um, intermediate data between the raw data and our final model. So. We build our system based on this, based on distance. All of the uh, all of the local will train their model locally. My uh, the local will keep their raw data forever. They don't need to reveal their raw data to the uh, other people. Um, at the beginning of the training, uh, uh, in our system, we have. For example, let me use three local as example. And uh, if we have three local sites and one global server, in our case, the global server is HPC uh, cluster in Case Western Reserve University. Uh, although the, uh, but our, prelim, uh, our previous result is, because our research is divided by two stages. The so first stage is uh, simulation. The second stage is we re is currently current, currently we really deploy our system into the Android platform, and we make use of the uh, HPC cluster. So now the global server is the HPC cluster, and the local site is the Android platform. It can be a smartphone, or tablet, or any computing modules, um, and. Um, the initial global model is initialized in HPC cluster. And when the first local, local one, want to train something, the local one need to download the initial model, initial global model from the HPC server. And uh, OK, now I have the initial model. And I can begin to, I, 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 I can begin to train. And uh, after I train the local model one using my raw data, 
I will update the uh, I will select part select some gradient and upload only upload this gradient to the global server, namely HPC. And it's a HPC is responsible for updating the global model only based on the gradient information revealed by local one. The raw, notice that the raw data is still in the local one. The HPC will not know the raw data at all. And uh, after the local one finished the training, the local two begin to train. The local two can download the up the latest version of the global model and uh, train the local local model based on the raw data of the local two. In this process, the local one and the local two will not exchange their raw data. They only exchange the gradient. In uh, uh, in, 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 in this way, the, we call it like decentralized training. In this way, the raw data is always in our, in our hand. Nobody can know this. And uh, actually, we have two layers of protection. The first layer is the gradient. The second layer is we only partially upload the gradient like 10% or 1%. And our experimental result reveals that 10% or 1% gradient is enough to, uh, to, get the, uh, to get the useful global model. And uh, the data exchange protocol have two order. The first is round robin. The second is blocking asynchronous. Actually, the round robin is the special case of the blocking as uh, is it, it, the, the special case of blocking asynchronous. For round robin, each local train one by one. At a given time, only one local is training, and uh, the other local are remain idols. But for asynchronous, at a given time, maybe two local are training at the same time. They download the initial model or the latest version of the current model at the same time, and they begin to train. But when they upload the gradient, it still need to be one by one. So we call it like blocking asynchronous. And uh, we, use, uh, we use the data set, uh, we download the data set from the UCI, and uh, like human activity recognition. Uh, actually, currently we add another data set, and we collect the video data set by ourselves, but I didn't put it on the PowerPoint. And uh, uh, for the preliminary result, we add the two, dif uh, two different algorithms, convolutional neural network and the multi-layer perceptron. And we evaluate our, uh, our system using our uh, unique matrix, reconstruction rate. And, um, the reconstruction rate, because the because we we are we we are designing a decentralized. And you had like thirty. That's finished. Like finished in thirty seconds. Oh, okay, 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 okay. But uh, uh, but okay. I uh, sorry, sorry, sorry for over time. But I have already presented all of my central idea actually. So if you have any question, we can uh, discuss later. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Finally, I would like to invite Nicholas Melling on the podium. The title of his presentation is Patient Specific Modeling of Local Field Potentials Recorded from Deep Brain Stimulation Electrodes. Hi, so I'm going to talk to you guys about some local field potential modeling. Um, we record these things from deep brain stimulation electrodes, which Cubby talked about earlier today. So I'm hoping you'll have some background for that. So I'm going to start by defining what a local field potential really is. It's basically a brain wave. It's oscillatory activity that we record from the brain. And in this case, we're using that depth electrode that is being also being used for a therapy. 
What the local field potential represents is kind of the aggregate activity of neurons in the vicinity of the electrode. But I do a lot of hand waving when I say that because we don't really know quantitatively how many neurons are participating in the LFP or where they are or what the extent of the LFP is. And that's really a big limitation in interpreting these kinds of results. And that's where computational modeling can come in to try and increase the uh, way we understand these local field potentials. Uh, LFP recordings are useful clinically. So yes, we use this electrode to stimulate, but more uh, these modern generation stimulation devices record local field potentials and then store them on the device itself and use that to do responsive stimulation or some other kind of uh, new age next generation therapy. So a lot of clinicians are looking at these local field potentials because they have some potential value for, uh, for treating these patients. In this specific case, I'm going to talk to you guys about beta oscillations within the subthalamic nucleus. This is a particular feature that we see in Parkinson's patients. So uh, a Parkinson's patient has elevated beta activity, which is defined as this 20 hertz oscillation there. And when we treat them with DBS or even a, um, a pill that will help them with their symptoms either way, this beta oscillation gets decreased. And so it's led to a lot of people to think of this beta oscillation as being really integral into the expression of the symptoms. It might be part of the disease itself. And some other clinicians have tried to use this beta oscillation, for example, for surgical targeting. So when they're implanting this electrode in the head, they can record these beta oscillations. And when, when they get to the area where the maximum beta oscillation is, then they figure, well, maybe that's a good place to put the electrode. So you can see there we have that on the spectrogram. As you go through the STN and you record beta activity in that deep red area, that's kind of the maximum beta. So they think that might be the sweet spot. Uh, it turns out that didn't really work so well. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that when you are recording a beta oscillation, it's not necessarily the neurons that are right around the electrode that are responsible for uh, that recording. And that's a modeling result. So I'm going to show you guys how we get there. So to construct a local field potential model, you really need two parts. The volume conductor represents the electrode and the brain itself. And then you add into it a bunch of current sources. Here, the neurons themselves are providing the electrical activity. The electrode itself is only passive. We're not stimulating from the electrode. We're only using it to record the endogenous activity of the brain itself. And so each of these neurons that's going to be a part of the model has its own robust kind of electrical life. Uh, it receives an input, and then it, receives an, or it spits out an output, just like a real neuron would. So we take a whole bunch of these neurons and we put them in the vicinity of the electrode and we have a pretty realistic situation of what we're recording. So in this case, we've used an actual scan from the patient who has one of these devices implanted to reconstruct the subthalamic nucleus, which is this oval shape here. And then we populate it with a whole bunch of neurons. So in this case, we're using realistic densities, which is about 1,000 neurons per uh, cubic millimeter. And so it's hard to display that. The actual density is on the right there, and that, those dots just represent the cell bodies. If you want to look at the whole dendritic arbor and the whole rest of these neurons, which have a, a complex geometry, it's just too much to see. So we use actual patient, patient data to construct these models, as well as some a priori knowledge from post-mortem studies looking at this area. So I mentioned we need a lot of different neurons to do this, and this is where the HPC comes into play. We have about 230,000 neurons each behaving independently in this model, and each one is modeled in, by itself. So we have a population of neurons that I'm pumping in a synchronous kind of input, so a 20 hertz wave goes into these neurons, and they're going to represent the beta activity in our model. So I have a, a single neuron that receives a 20 hertz input, and then I repeat that, say, about 10,000 times. So I have this population of neurons that's behaving in a correlated way. They're all receiving an input that's correlated, and their output is also correlated. So you can see that on the right. This is the, the large trace is an example of how one neuron might behave. And then the inset shows an overlay of 10 neurons, and you can see their activity is correlated. Now, if you contrast that to the other population of neurons, which I would call an asynchronous population, their input is random. They're not receiving a 20 hertz input. They're receiving an input with some frequency. Um, and then it might be faster, might be slower. 
And when you overlay a bunch of neurons, you can see that their activity is not correlated whatsoever. They're on the right. It's just a kind of random activity. So we have these two large populations of neurons. One is synchronous, one is asynchronous. And that fits our intuition about how the uh, subthalamic nucleus is organized. There's some part of it that's participating in the circuits that are involved with the symptoms of this disease. And the rest of the subthalamic nucleus is doing something else. Maybe it's I don't know, trying to remember where you parked your car. So the green neurons represent the synchronous activity. The blue ones represent kind of background activity. And then when you put all that together, we get a local field potential. So you can see the model result and some experimental results as well. These are recorded from the same patient that we use to build the model. So they have the same geometry in their subthalamic nucleus. The volume is the same. And presumably, they have a similar number of neurons that are perhaps behaving in a similar way. Excuse me. So these models are, are quite realistic, and we can use them to try and capture uh, features of the local field potential that we see clinically. So um, now we can change the parameters of the model to try and explore that space. So you might want to know how many neurons are participating in the synchronous oscillation. So we can change, for example, the radius of that uh, synchronous population of neurons until more and more of the subthalamic nucleus is receiving synchronous input. So with a radius of eight millimeters, the entire thing is really just pulsing at 20 hertz. And you can see beta kind of goes up. So as you increase the number of synchronous neurons, you get an increase in the beta oscillation power. However, there's some caveats there. This is not a linear increase by any means. And so um, there are some interesting things there that you lose when you compare it to an idealized model, right? So if you just assume the subthalamic nucleus is a sphere um, and you don't use any patient data to try and build your models, you get these different looking results. And so the takeaway here is that by including a lot of these patient specific factors and complexities in our models, we can capture certain aspects of the local field potential. Now, we can use these to then go return to the experimental data and say, okay, well, how does it compare? And then we can do a parameter search and say, well, maybe we can say something about the underlying neural activity that created this experimental local field potential that we couldn't before. And uh, that's all. So I want to say thanks to everyone involved, including the HPC folks. Uh, you know, when you're simulating 20,000 neurons, it helps to parallelize them. So we appreciate your help with that. So uh, I think we can go ahead and uh, have our uh, vendor, uh, MathWorks. My name is Adam Barber. I'm with the MathWorks. I'm an application engineer. What I'm going to be talking about today is some new technology that we have that can help you tackle big data. So we'll talk in general about big data problems. We'll talk about some of the tools that we have to help you out with those. Uh, the other person I'd like to introduce in the room is Corey Winder, who is back there. He is the account manager for Case Western. All right, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and just dive in. Uh, I'm not so used to having a microphone when I present, so if I walk away from it, I apologize. Um, but let's, let's get started talking about what big data is. All right, whenever someone is talking about big data, we often find that what they mean varies based on the problem that they're working on and what technology they have available to them. If I'm just working on my laptop, well, then, if I'm talking about the order of 10 gigabytes, that might be big data for me. If I have access to an HPC, well, now I might be talking about petabytes or exabytes. All right. So when I say big data, I'm going to go to Wikipedia, the source of all truth in the universe, to get my definition. And I really like this definition, which is that big data is any time that I need to change the way that I approach my analysis just due to either the size or complexity of my data. And this definition works really nicely because it translates up and it translates down depending on what environment I'm working in and depending on what problem I'm working on. All right, so when I say big data, this is really what I mean. Now, I know at least some people here are working with big data, and so you're probably familiar with the problems that people come across. But if you aren't, I'm going to lay out some of the ones that we see out in the field here. So one is that the traditional tools that we have just flat out might not work. And so we might need to learn new tools, we might need to learn new algorithms, new programming languages, new paradigms, just to be able to handle the size of our data. 
On top of that, because we're spending so much time learning these new tools or changing our analysis, the quality and speed of our results are going to be impacted. And then finally, even if I have access to a huge computing cluster, my computation time might be immense. All right, so these are not the only problems that we see, but these are the three main problems that we see. And if we think about this from the workflow that someone using big data might use, well, the first thing that they need to do is get access to their data. And this is much easier said than done, especially when we're talking about these big data problems. We're often talking about large collections of files. It's not typically typical that I have one petabyte sized file. Instead, I might have thousands of gigabyte sized files or something along those lines. So just getting access to my data might be an issue. I might not even be able to load all of that data on my desktop or my laptop, whatever your personal workstation may be. And so if I'm going to be working on a small machine to prototype or develop an algorithm, this often means that I'm working with, let's say, a subset of my data, or I'm adapting traditional tools to work on this big data in some way that might not work very well. The final step, once you have something prototyped, would be to scale this up to a cluster, like the HPC that you have here. Now, I say it like it's easy, but clearly this is very difficult, which is why you guys have an entire team dedicated to helping you out with this. All right. Translating either to a traditional HPC cluster or a big data cluster is a technical challenge and requires some expertise in those areas. All right. So our developers, we, we brought to them all these problems that people were having working with big data, and we laid out some requirements for what, this had, what our solution had to look like. So one is that we need to be able to access that data easily, no matter how or where it's stored. If I can't get access to my data in the first place, there's no point in even moving forward. Once I have that, we know how important it is for people to be able to prototype their algorithms using smaller data sets. Prototyping on the huge data set might not be helpful because it might take too long or it takes me too long to get to insights. If I can develop something quickly on a small data set and then scale it up, that's ideal. And once again, it needs to scale easily to these clusters, whether they are traditional HPC clusters or let's say a Hadoop uh, big data distributed file system cluster. The final one to me is the most important because there are technologies that allow me to do this, but none of them allow me to do it with syntax that I already know or using a tool that I already know. So for us, the whole point in doing this is making sure that we provide a tool that doesn't require that our users learn an entire new syntax. All right, so we did this. And we did this with something called tall arrays. And these are gonna be the focus of my talk today. So these came out with our uh, second most recent release, R2016B. If you're not familiar with MATLAB, we have two major releases a year, an A and a B release. The A comes out in the we say spring time frame, and the B comes out in the fall time frame. Our 2017A just came out about a month ago. That's what I'll be using for my demonstration today. But tall arrays were introduced last fall in our 2016B. And these are a data type that is designed for when my data does not fit into memory. We design them for observations where I have, uh, excuse me, we design them for data sets where you have lots of observations, which is where the term tall came from. So if we think of having many, many, let's say, Excel sheets or CSV files, if we think about what those would look like stacked on top of each other, we have kind of a countable number of columns, which could even still be in the thousands potentially, and then many, many, many rows, which at this point I'm just going to consider infinite because it doesn't matter how many I have. And again, the key here is that it's going to look like whatever MATLAB array you're building it off of. So tall arrays support a number of different data types, whether it's numeric or text or date times, as well as tons of different functionality, especially where we think we thought for a first pass that it made sense. And this is functionality that we're still expanding. And so we'd love to hear your thoughts if there are places where you'd like to see this functionality extended. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how these work under the hood before we dive into a demonstration. So if we Look up here, we might imagine a situation where I have four files. So these four files, I'm zoomed in a little bit, where each file may or may not fit into memory. It doesn't really matter. 
The key here is that all of these files together don't fit into memory. So what I'm going to do then is think about all of my files as if they were one continuous file. And the tall array under the hood is going to automatically chunk this data set up for me. So if you've ever done big data, one of the things you know is that you need to manually do this chunking process, reading in chunks, processing them, maybe writing it out to an intermediate file, moving on to the next chunk. And if you're familiar with the MapReduce framework, you're effectively doing this. So they're going to scan through this tall array or the, through this data set one chunk at a time and do that processing as they go. And the code that we're going to write to do this processing is the same for tall arrays as it is for any ordinary MATLAB array. If you have the parallel computing toolbox, which gives you access to additional computing cores in your own machine, then you can take advantage of those cores to help you scan through your data set. So my laptop has two cores. So in this example, when I have an operation, I can have two scans happening at the same time, hopefully doubling my speed. Now, if I scale this up to a cluster, whether this is a Spark-enabled Hadoop cluster or traditional HPC cluster with MATLAB distributed computing server, I can take advantage of as many nodes as I have, as many workers as I have, as I have access to, to split up my processing. Right, and so this is how we're going to scale it up. The example that we're going to work with today is predicting the cost of a taxi ride in New York City. And we're going to be using a publicly available data set from the city of New York. Uh, we're going to be working with a smaller local file, set of files. It's about 20 megabytes in size. But I'll show you how we can scale this up to the full data set with 25 gigabytes. Now, in theory, I could do the entire processing for the 25 gigabyte file on my laptop. But even with my two cores, it's going to take me a lot longer than an hour to do all the work that we're going to do. So I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit by showing you how this would work with smaller files. But the way that I work with it in MATLAB is the same way that MATLAB would do it if I was working on the 25 gigabyte data set. All right. So with that, I'm going to jump into MATLAB. And just a brief show of hands, how many people in the room are currently using MATLAB or have used MATLAB? OK, great. So I can skip my intro to MATLAB, and we can dive right in. Uh, if you haven't used MATLAB in a long time, it might look a little bit different. I'm using 2017A. This is our latest release. And the demonstration that I'm going to be doing today, I'm going to be using a live script. So this is part of the live editor that was introduced uh, about a year ago or two years ago at this point. And the live editor is a lot like the traditional editor in that I can include text and MATLAB code. The difference is that I can include rich text formatting, things like these titles and these images embedded directly into my document. And so these are really good for presentations like the one that I'm doing. And it's also really handy anytime that you want to have your outputs embedded directly in your document or you want to start formatting your document as you build it up. The first thing that I'm going to do is start up my pool of MATLAB workers. And all this means is I'm creating two MATLAB processes that are going to run on the two cores of my machine. And my main MATLAB, anytime it needs to use those, is going to act like the scheduler. So it's going to do the communication for me. And anything that I do with tall arrays is going to happen automatically in parallel. So I'm starting up those processes. And when that's available, MATLAB will move on to the next section. And we can talk about how we're going to bring this data into MATLAB. All right. So my pool is available. Let's go ahead and take a look at the smaller data set that I have here. So if we look in this folder, it's called smaller taxi data, because I'm only working with 20 megabytes, remember. I have 12 files, 12 comma separated value files from the year 2015, one for each month. Now, if I open up one of these in Excel, we see the kind of thing that we would expect. We have a number of different columns explaining what our data is, and we have uh, a lot of observations for each column. Now, for traditional processing, what I would probably do is use something like uh, the import tool or um, potentially write some code to create a function that will bring my data in from my CSV file. And that would work just fine. 
Now in this case, what I want to do is create, oh, apparently I ran through my whole, I'm giving you guys a sneak preview. I accidentally ran through the whole script. Um, but don't worry, I'll just close any windows that pop up and you can pretend like you didn't see them. So what I'm going to do is use this notion of something called a data store. Now what a data store is, is an object that represents a collection of files. Okay, so if I look at this command right here, I'm creating a data store based on that folder smaller taxi data and everything that ends in 2015.csv. Right, so the star is acting like a glob. If you're familiar with writing commands at a command prompt, should look pretty familiar. So let's go ahead and get a preview of what this looks like. So I see here basically what I saw in Excel. I see the different columns that I had, a preview of that data. When I did this, I didn't load in my entire data set. When I'm working with a data store, the assumption is that I'm working with a huge amount of data, or I'm working with many, many, many different files. And as we know, anytime we're dealing with the hard disk, that's when we're going to have performance hits. So we want to minimize the amount of time that we spend reading and writing from disk. So all this does is read in the first eight or so rows so that I can get a sense of what my data looks like. And the reason for that is before I truly bring my data into MATLAB, I can start doing customizations. So for example, in this case, there might only be a couple of columns that I'm really interested, maybe a couple of features that I think are going to be important. Now, I can always come back and modify this, but for a first pass, I'm just going to select a couple of features. And I also might want to give them more human readable names. So for example, I'm just selecting uh, these variables here, the pickup time, the drop off time, the distance, how much they paid, how they paid, uh, whether they tipped, and what the total amount was. I can run another preview. Again, it hasn't modified anything on disk. All it's doing is helping me customize how I'm going to bring this data into MATLAB. And so now I see in my preview just the rows that I selected with the names that I wanted. There's a lot of other formatting I can do here. Let's say I wanted to customize what my dates looked like, things like that. Now from this data store, I'm going to create this tall array. So the tall array, in this case, is going to be a tall table, is going to give me a way to access the data in my data store as if it was already in memory. So from here, this looks like a regular MATLAB table, if you've ever used them, with one big exception. That's going to look pretty weird if you've been using MATLAB for a while. And that's that the size is m by 7. At this point, MATLAB knows how many columns it has. Right? The number of columns can't change. What it doesn't know is how many rows it has, because it hasn't run through every single line of my data file, because I haven't asked it to yet. Remember, we want to minimize, we want to be lazy about this. We want to minimize the number of operations that we do with the hard disk. So I have this m by 7 tall table. I have no idea how many rows it has. I know it has seven columns. And at this point, I can start preparing operations that I want to do on my data. So one thing I might want to do is provide some better labels for my payment type. So here, my payment type is integers 2, 1, I think there's 3 to 6. But these don't really mean anything to me as a human. Now, if I go back to my original data source, I might know that uh, one is cash and two is credit card, or maybe it's vice versa, because keeping, these things, keeping track of these things is not easy. So instead, I'm going to represent these as a categorical array. And a categorical is exactly what it sounds like. It represents categories. So here I can give these human readable names. I also might want to create new features from my data set. So in this case, what I'm going to say is, I have a feeling that what time of day it is might play a role. And maybe it plays a role because of the type of passengers you pick up. Maybe it plays a role because of traffic. I'm not entirely sure, but I think this might be a useful feature. So what I'm going to do is create a new column. Now, this didn't run through my entire data set and write out to disk an entire new column. What it did was now it knows that whenever I want to perform an operation, it will run through. And if I ever do something that involves the hour, it knows how to calculate it. I'm building up a recipe for when I do explicit calculations. Now, one thing I want to mention is a notion of checkpointing. 
So if you have a data set and you do some pre-processing work, that pre-processing work isn't written out to disk. But if you're going to be working with this data set a lot, you might want to write those out to disk so you don't have to go through those operations every single time. Now we have commands for that. There is a write command for tall tables, tall variables. It writes it out to mat files, which have the convenience of being compressed and easily read into MATLAB with the data store. So it's very easy to checkpoint your work in a sense, commit everything you've done, if you're familiar with source control, and then have access to kind of a cleaned up version of your data set anytime you want to pull it back in. All right, so let's do some calculations. Let's get an idea of the kind of data that we're working with. So a couple of things we might be interested in are how long each trip is in terms of minutes. What's the average cost per minute? Or how about how much are people tipping? So we can calculate all these things, and I'm just creating new features. I also might want to do things like remove outliers. And in this case, I'm doing that with logical indexing. So logical indexing is a technique in MATLAB that makes it really easy to slice and index into variables. If you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to check out our documentation for how it works. It's a really powerful tool, especially when you're dealing with large data sets. You might be tempted to, let's say, write a for loop that goes through and checks each element. You know, For each row, was the trip less than half a minute? Was it longer than four hours, et cetera, et cetera? If I do that in MATLAB, it's going to be much slower than taking this vectorized approach of logical indexing. So here I'm just removing some, some data sets that I think are bad in some way. Now, this might not be the most statistically rigorous way to do it. I should probably be keeping track of this. But I'm just showing you guys a demonstration of how I might go about this. If you're doing this in practice, maybe you would take a note of which uh, points you're getting rid of. Maybe you would do a smoothing spline or try and model what this missing data looks like. How you do that is going to depend on your data set and what you're trying to accomplish. But in this case, I'm just saying some things that are unreasonable, like a negative fare. Somehow you got the cab driver to pay you for your ride. That's incredible. But we're not going to count you in, your, in our data set, in our analysis. Now, once again, I haven't explicitly performed any of these computations. All right. So let me just make sure I didn't. Great. So let me give you guys an example of the kinds of things that we might want to do. Um, so one thing is we might want to subset our data. Right? I talked earlier about how one common piece of this workflow is working with a smaller piece of data to help you prototype. So here, I'm just going to pull out 20,000 rows. And that's what I'm going to use to prototype my algorithm. And then we'll scale it back up to the full algorithm. Now, when I'm working with this TT sub uh, table, oh, that's weird. It should be a table, not a structure. But that's all right. I can look at things like uh, different fields. I can do histograms of that data get a sense of the number of trips by payment type. You know what? I think it's because I reran this. Sorry. I'm just going to run this one more time and make sure that we are working with the clean data set. And this is a great place where checkpointing would have saved me a lot of time. All right, so let's calculate this summary again. Make sure that this pulls in correctly. All right, well, I'm not exactly sure why it's a struct and not a table. Uh, it's possible that I had messed something up. But it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, we can still prototype with this data set. So I can look at, let's say, histograms, get a sense that, OK, it turns out that most people are paying with credit cards. Maybe if we had done this 20 years ago, most people would be paying with cash. And depending on what I might be interested in, maybe I'm interested in looking at, well, what happens in the, the instances where there's no charge? Why does that occur? So maybe I want to pull out that piece of data. Or maybe I don't care about it. So these histograms, these visualizations, are one reason why you might want to work with a subset to be able to do these visualizations. Get insight into your data at a high level. 
I also might want to do some group calculations. So in this case, what I am calculating is the mean of, let me run this with output so we can see what it looks like. Maybe I want the mean of different values so I can get a sense of, okay, what's the mean trip duration or fare? Now in this case, my uh, tall variable is small enough and in memory that I can run the entire operation on it. Now if my tall variable did not fit in memory, MATLAB wouldn't give me an answer yet because I haven't explicitly asked it for it. And the way I explicitly ask for it is with this gather command right here. So if I had you know, truly out of memory data and I wanted to pull it into memory, I execute this gather command. So the way that these tall variables work is in a sense, I queue up a number of commands. I tell it, here's the different things that I want you to do. When I give it a gather command or a small subset of other commands, MATLAB is going to go through and execute those commands in full. Okay. So and I want to emphasize that for a second, because when we work in MATLAB, we often think that anytime I ask for a result, I'm going to get that result back immediately. But when I'm working with tall variables, that is not the case. I need to explicitly ask for them. And this turns out to be for my advantage. Remember we talked about how we want to make sure that we do the minimum number of passes through my data set? If I work with uh, tall arrays, and every time I ask for a mean or a standard deviation, it goes through my entire data set and makes all these calculations, I'm slowing everything down. Whereas instead, if I tell it, hey, I want the mean of this and the standard deviation of this, now go ahead and calculate them. It can do all of that in one pass through the data and save me a lot of time. Right, so we think that MATLAB is being lazy, but really it's being lazy for our own benefit. All right. Now, once we have these results in memory, we can explore them in the same way that we might. So I'm going to pop these out to the side over here so we can get kind of an easier view. So here I was looking at the average cost per hour of day. So we see that for the most part during the main part of the day, the prices are pretty stagnant. But late at night and very early in the morning, the prices rise. Now that might be the opposite of what you expect. You'd probably expect that during a rush hour, the cab fares are highest, but maybe people just aren't going as far. So this is something that's interesting. We also might wanna wonder, well, what about tips? Does the amount that somebody tips vary based on how long, uh, what time of day it is? And with this bar chart, you know, maybe it's a little bit hard to tell because really what we wanna know is a percentage. The thing here is that it's so easy for me to check these things, to do these visualizations, to get a sense of what's happening in my data, that there's no harm done for trying a visualization that doesn't really get me anywhere. But this brought me to my next point. Maybe I want to look at percentage instead. So I can look at percentage as the hour of the day. And it turns out that for the most part, people tip between 12 and 14%. Except for for some reason at 4 AM, there's a huge spike in tips. Now, this might be because people are inebriated. It might be because people just want to get home. We don't exactly know, but there's definitely something interesting going on here early in the morning. And maybe if we binned our times differently or looked at drop-off times instead of pickup times, we'd see something different. But let's also not forget that we're just working with a subset of the data. So maybe when we look at the whole data set, we might see something different. Maybe it just happens that in these first 20,000 rows, we just happen to have more people who tip more at 4 a.m. It could just be uh, an artifact in the data. All right. Is there a way for us to know how many people are in each bin? So each row, the question was, is there any way for us to know how many people are in each bin? Um, the, for us right now, each row of our data set is one taxi ride. So we don't know how many unique people rode in a cab. You know, if somebody took 20 fares a day in one day, it looks the same as if we, they took, uh, 20 different people took one. So in that sense, no, but in the sense of how many taxi rides there are, yes, we know. So in this data set, there are 20,000. Uh, how many there are in each bin? We could do a number of rides per hour of day, and that would give us some insight. Um, so we could absolutely calculate that. 
No problem. It's a good question. All right. So there's some other things we might be interested in, things like uh, vehicle speed as the day progresses. So guess what? During the middle of the day and during rush hour in Manhattan, cars go slower. Okay, makes sense. Now it's probably what you expected, but these visual checks help make sure that there's some intuition there. And when you're working on problems that are in kind of a physical basis, this is really where your scientific or engineering expertise comes into play, where you can provide insight and make sure that, okay, this data set confirms what I suspect. And if it doesn't, that means one of two things. One, your data set's wrong, or you found something really novel. Now, more often it's the former, but if you're really lucky, it's the latter. All right, so that's visualizations on data that we've brought into memory. But one of the things we might wanna do is visualize the entire data set that we have. So there are a couple of visualizations that we have overloaded for tall variables that work directly on out of memory data. One of them is the histogram, All right? So what this does is it goes through the data set and as it goes through the data set, it tosses numbers into bins. And so this is one way I can do kind of data reduction in some sense. One way I can get a sense of, um, a sense of my full, full data set. So this would work on the entire 25 gigabyte data set. MATLAB just needs to run through it and do those binnings for us. And what we see in trip distance is probably what you would expect. We have a distribution that trails off to the right because you can't go any less than zero, but from downtown Manhattan, you might need to go out to Long Island or the suburbs or the airports, these kind of longer trips that might be more miles. But for the most part, people are staying within Manhattan going just a couple of miles. So again, confirming our suspicions. Another thing that we can do is something called a bin scatter plot. And the histogram is really nice for getting a sense of the distribution of one variable. This bin scatter plot is a new visualization that can help me kind of do a cross between a 2D histogram and a heat map. So what this allows me to see is the relationship between two variables across my data. So if we think about this like a histogram, what I've done is I've binned my two variables in this case, I'm looking at the fare and the trip distance. And by doing that, I've created grids or blocks. So I have cells in some sense. And these cells are color coded by the number of observations in them. This slider on the right, this gamma, this just allows me to kind of change the color scale so I can see densities a little bit better in some areas. All right. Now for the most part, this probably looks like you expect. As our distance goes up, our fare goes up, mostly linearly, at least in this section. Now, once we go out to further distances, the fare goes up maybe more than linearly. So maybe there's some additional factors happening here. And the other thing to note is we have this kind of flat bar across the middle, which is really interesting. And when I first saw this, I was a little confused as to what was happening. I thought maybe there was a problem with our data set. But no, it turns out that what we're seeing here, most likely, I haven't actually been able to confirm this, is flat rides to and from the airport. In many cities, there's a flat fare from downtown to the airport. Now, it turns out that if you're in this bucket over here, you should tell them you're going someplace near the airport and then walk. Save yourself a little money. And over here, these guys are getting a good bargain. But seeing these things, maybe we want to take these out of our calculation if we're trying to predict taxi fare. Maybe I don't care about people who are going to the airport getting a flat fare. Maybe I want to be able to predict something else. So these bin scatter plots are a really nice way to visualize huge amounts of data and how two different variables relate. Now, this is extremely helpful if you want to do something like machine learning with your data. One of the things that you'll often find in machine learning is that you have two weak features or more that when combined together provide a strong feature for detection. Right, this is a classic problem in machine learning. I have a feature, it doesn't seem like it helps me at all, but it turns out that when I include it in my training algorithm, I get much better results than when I don't because the two combine in some way that I didn't expect to give me a strong feature. 
All right. Let's pop this back in. So speaking of machine learning, this is one other thing that tall variables can do. Because oftentimes, visualization or high-level statistics are not enough. What I really want to do is build models, whether that's predictive or descriptive, whether it's classification, whether it's regression. It doesn't really matter. So what I'm going to do here is use the full, full 20 megabyte data set that I'm working with and do some learning on that. Now, of course, the first step that I have to do is pull out a test set and a training set. If you've worked with machine learning, you know that one of the, the biggest mistakes you can make is overfit your model to the data. And the easiest way to do that is to test your model on data it's seen to train. And in fact, many people will take this a step further and say, well, you can't just have training and testing data sets. You also need to have a third validation data set, or potentially more, if you're working on tuning things like hyperparameters. Now, we have tools to help you do that. I'm using this function from the Statistics and Machine Learning Toolbox to help me do um, training and testing partitioning. Um, here, I'm just going to use a simple holdout method. If I was working with a smaller data set, I might want to do cross, uh, cross fold. But here, I'm just going to use something simple as a holdout method. And now I might want to fit a predictive model. In this case, we're doing something simple. We're just going to try and predict the taxi fare. So here, I'm doing regression. Whenever I have a regression problem, I always start with a linear model every single time. Linear models are really good for a couple of things. One is they're simple, and they're easy to understand. Now, the, sim the simple part of it, people might think that, oh, that's a bad thing. How can simple be good? My problem is so complex. But it lessens the risk of me to overfit my model to my data. Because if I'm working with a simple model, it doesn't have the ability to fit itself to all the different noise in my data set. Right, so think about fitting a line to a line with some noise to a high degree polynomial. Yeah, a ninth degree polynomial will have very small errors, but it'll do a really bad job of actually predicting what your line looks like. The other thing that I like is that they're really easy to understand. So here I'm doing something simple. I'm just looking at how does the fare relate to the time of day and how far someone went with a constant offset term. And in this case, these terms really mean something. This intercept of $4 and a quarter, well, this is the flat fare that you get when you walk into a cab and they turn on the meter. This $2.78, well, this is about what you pay per mile. And you also pay about two cents per hour. Now, these things might not sound quite right, and maybe we need to tune the model a little bit, but this is already giving me some insight into what's going on. Linear models also provide a really nice benchmark for what uh, I should compare my other models against. Right, so if I'm going to try a more complex model, it better do a better job than my simple linear model. So from here, I get my model back. My model is fully trained on that out of memory data set. I can explore it. I can look at things like R squared values. So in this case, my R squared value is about 0.9. Whether that's good or bad, it's going to depend on your problem. That's not something that I can tell you. In some cases, in some fields, a R squared value of 0.9 is, is good. In some places, it's incredible. In some places, it's not good enough. So it depends on what you're working on. I can also, let's say, plot slices. So look at how my, uh, my predictions look as a function of my independent variables. This tends to be more useful if you have more complex models than with this model, because already I, can, I get a sense of what my model looks like just from the coefficients. And now I can use this model to do prediction on that out of memory data set. So remember, I created my testing and my training data sets from an out of memory data set, which means that they were both out of memory this whole time. And I haven't started using my test data set. So this is where I'm going to do that for the first time. So I'm going to predict on it. And that went really fast, because guess what? It hasn't actually done the calculations yet. Remember, I'm queuing up this recipe. 
I'm telling it all the different things that I want it to do when I have it finally execute. So I come back to my final histogram. I can run this. And now I get a sense of my residuals. Right, so this is when it ran through it. So what I see here is that for the most part, it looks like I have a relatively normal distribution, although maybe it's skewed. Centered a little higher than zero. So maybe I tend to be underestimating my fares. And you know, maybe I'm maybe there are some places where I can do a better job. Right. Now the easiest thing I could do is get in a New York taxi and look at the sticker on it that tells me the formula for how they charge me, but that's not as fun as doing this. And this also tends to be a really nice example. The thing I really like about this is this data set is publicly available. So if you have MATLAB, you can go ahead and download it, play around with this tall variable, even if you don't have a really large data set. And 25 gigabytes is a really nice size because it's big enough that doing this on my desktop is a challenge, but it's not so big that I can't fit it on my hard drive to play around with. So if you're interested in exploring this, I would encourage you to check this out. All right, so that's my uh, demonstration part. Uh, so I want to jump back to PowerPoint and talk about how we can scale this up to a cluster. All right. So I've talked only so far about what I'm doing on my desktop. So what do I need to change in order to run this on a cluster? The main cluster I'm going to be talking about is a Spark-enabled Hadoop cluster. If you're not familiar with Hadoop, it is a uh, big data file system typically known as the Hadoop distributed file system. Spark is a framework that sits on top of Hadoop that makes it really easy to do lots of different kinds of computations. So if you have tried working with Hadoop before Spark, you probably were working with MapReduce. If you're working with MapReduce, you probably felt the pain of working with MapReduce. Spark makes all of those operations much easier. And in fact, a lot of what we did with Tall was based off what we liked about Spark. So in order to set this up, I only need to add a couple of lines of code. The first thing I'm going to do is tell it, hey, what are the environment variables that you need to know? Where does my Hadoop cluster live? Where does my Spark live? Then I have a couple of lines of code that tell it what this execution environment is going to look like. So those first lines are setting up my comp computational environment. These next three are setting up my MATLAB environment. And then I'm just going to point it to my data. Now, in this case, I don't have the data located on my local disk. Instead, I have it located at a HDFS location, Hadoop Distributed File System location. I just need to point it to that, make a data store out of it, just like I did on my desktop, make a tall variable out of that, and I can run this on the cluster. So I have a quick video of running uh, a slightly different algorithm, but it's doing effectively the same thing training a machine learning model. This is running on a Spark Hadoop cluster that we have back at MathWorks headquarters. Actually, this, I believe, is running on Amazon EC2. I apologize. Um, it's pulling that data set in from a file, creating that tall array, and now it's just going to try and train that machine learning algorithm. Now, the one thing that I didn't show you as part of the live script is the fact that uh, MATLAB will show you the progress of your tall operations if you're running it at the command line, which can be really handy if you're doing long operations. But even still, on that 25 gigabyte file, I was able to train this model in 12 minutes. Now, I'm not saying you can't do this faster in other environments, or you can't do it faster if you know how to write your own Spark code. The key here is I don't need to know any of that. I can just write regular MATLAB code, put it on a Hadoop Spark cluster, and run it there. All right, so at this point, uh, we have a little over 15 minutes left. I do want to leave some time for questions. Um, so I want to talk about the general capabilities of tall arrays. So remember, the key here is that we're working on data that doesn't fit in memory. So everything we chose, we chose with this in mind. Again, the first thing that we always need to do during that workflow is access our data. So we wanted to make sure that data access was available. And that works from. Uh, ASCII files, databases, spreadsheets, or custom files. This is almost entirely through the use of a data store object. And we have data stores for all of these. 
Now I included custom file on there because sometimes people think, well, my data doesn't come in any of these clean formats. I'm working with this instrument that outputs data in some crazy binary format. Am I totally out of luck? No, absolutely not. You can write a custom read function for data store and create a data store for any custom file that you have. One of the most important things that we do, especially when we're working with large data, and in fact, when we talk to data scientists, where they spend most of their time is in this data munging step. How do I pre-process it? How do I remove missing data? How do I handle outliers? How do I clean up my data set? So we provided hundreds of functions for those, and we're building those out every release. We also have visualizations. So I showed you two, histogram and bin scatter plot. We're still building those out. So if there are specific visualizations that you think would be helpful and make sense in a big data world, let us know. We're looking for feedback on that. We also know that the main thing people want to do with this is build models, whether it's regression or classification or even potentially clustering. We have tools for, for doing that. And if we think back to that workflow, so we talked about accessing data, right? Primarily through this data store, whether that data lives locally, whether it lives on a Hadoop cluster, whether it lives in a database, we can pull that in, we can work on subsets on the desktop, or potentially even the entire data set to build insight and get some ideas about what we're gonna be doing. Just getting a handle on your data is so important and is a big challenge when you're working with these really large data sets. Uh, we, today I use the Parallel Computing Toolbox. It's not required for big data computations. I do recommend it because it's gonna help speed things up, especially if you're gonna be working with really large files. All right, and when I do that, I have two processes chunked through my data at once. I can run on compute clusters. So whether this is on a traditional cluster with the MATLAB distributed uh, computing server or a Spark enabled Hadoop cluster, you can run it on there. Now, if you put this on a Spark-enabled Hadoop cluster under the hood, it will be using those Spark libraries. If you put this on a MATLAB distributed computing server, traditional HPC cluster, it will run just like it did in MATLAB, but of course across your entire uh, computational nodes that you have access to. All right, so for me, the big takeaway is when do I use these? All right, so I've done this presentation a few times showing people about tall variables. One of the first questions I always get is, why don't I just use this all the time? Well, the answer is, if you can get away with it, you should never use them. You only use them when your data doesn't fit into memory. If you remember way back to the beginning, I talked about this definition for a big data problem. When I need to change the way that I do my processing purely based on the size of my data. Now, if I don't need to change the way that I'm doing my data processing, I shouldn't. There's no need. So I should only use these tall variables when my data doesn't fit into memory and when it fits into this kind of columnar structure, which we find that most data sets these days really does. All right, so I know what my columns are gonna be, or I can at least get a preview of what they will be, and they're not gonna change amongst the different files. They have consistent data types down the columns. So my uh, column that has temperature is not suddenly gonna start having characters. That will cause problems, that will appear as missing data. What's really nice about this is it doesn't matter what computing platform I have access to because I can do these computations on my desktop. Now, ideally, we want to scale these up to a cluster, but we don't have to. We have that capability if we have access to it. We don't need it if we, if we don't. And really, this is for any general statistics or machine learning application is what we recommend it for. All right, so hopefully what you got out of this is that we have tools that make it really easy, convenient, and scalable to work with these big data problems. I only showed you tall today. We have a number of different tools for working with big data. So if you need to do matrix operations, linear algebra, we have the distributed array, which allows your data to live on the entire cluster, the shared memory of, of multiple machines. If you need low level control and you're familiar with Spark, through the MATLAB compiler, we provide a MATLAB API for Spark. And this allows you to work with Spark RDDs directly from within MATLAB. We also have tools that let you finally control how you do processing on different workers in MATLAB through SPMD. 
So whatever level of control you need or whatever aspect you need to take advantage of with your big data problem, we have a solution for you. I just wanted to show you the latest and greatest today, especially since I only had an hour and I'm almost out because I wanted to leave time for questions. So again, for me, the big takeaway is I don't need to learn any new techniques or syntax to be able to handle these big data problems and ask bigger questions. And at the end of the day, that's what this is all about, being able to ask bigger questions. Uh, so with that, I am done. I would love to take any questions. Uh, and then I can also hang around for a little bit if people want to talk more generally about different application areas of MATLAB. So thank you for your time. Are there any questions on, on what I showed? What if you have unstructured data? What if you have unstructured data? That's a great question. Um, so if you have unstructured data, what you really want to do is think about how you can provide some structure to it. So if we think about the way that these tall variables work, I do need to have some structure associated with them. So for example, I need to know uh, what each column is going to have. Now, if your data uh, set internally is unstructured in that way, but you can impose some structure, then I would probably go the route of using a custom file data store with a customized read function so that it reads in a chunk and it knows how to process that into a specific structure. Now, if you can't do that, then I think you really need to handle it on a case-by-case -case basis. And that's the time where I would reach out to us and see what we think based on your specific problem. So is that common here that people have unstructured data sets? I guess it depends. Uh, sure. I think there are some, for example, if we want to examine our log files, right? Mm -hmm. So that's when uh, you, you can probably parse it, but you have to parse it first before being able to process it. Yeah, so in those cases, you would need to have a parsing step. Absolutely. Yep. And that is the reason behind using Hadoop too, right? Because it uses keyword pairs, something like that? Yeah, so. Data. <laughs> Yeah, it's been, it's been a little while since I've um, worked kind of at the low level of Hadoop, but in general, you do uh, require some kind of structure. So typically, we see unstructured uh, data files in kind of specialized, unstructured database formats. For the most part, we see most people trying to impose structure, trying to impose some kind of structure to their data. But yeah, we do see unstructured data sometimes. in MATLAB? Can you do the parsing in MATLAB? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So the parsing, d depending on what you want to do, we have you know, kind of high level file reading and writing operations as well as regular expressions. And then we also have low level reading and writing operations. So depending on what kind of parsing you need to do, yeah, absolutely. And you'd put that in your custom read function that you provide to your custom file data store. Yeah, excellent question. In the back. Mm -hmm. um, so does each of the files have headers for the columns, or does it correspond to your collection? That's a great question. So I'm just going to repeat the question to make sure everybody heard it. Uh, I have a collection of data files. Now, the first one has a header. I showed you guys that one. So the question is, uh, do the other data files have headers? And I assume the underlying question is, do they require headers or not? What happens if I do or what happens if I don't? So I can just open up one of these data files. So let's pick the one from April, so two years ago. And you can see here that this does have those header files. Now, it's not required. Um, one thing that you would want to do is specify. So one of the things you can specify in your data store is number of header lines, for example. So if I set that to 0 and I just told it what I wanted the column names to be, well, then for all the ones that weren't strings, it would give me not a number. But then I can remove those however I want it. So whether I do or whether I don't is a personal choice. We find for the most part what people have are files that are the same, just like what I have here. Now, if you happen to not have those header files, it's not a problem. 